Lovely, thank you. Right, so I'm going to hand over to my colleague now, my colleague Kevin, and um, Kevin is going to introduce the, the Talent CMK research team. Thanks, Miranda. So, good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin. It's very nice to be here again today after such a wonderful day yesterday. So, Miranda is going to talk about this research project that we did. But I just want to introduce it by saying what a what an incredibly inspiring experience it was for me. I think I'm the most junior member of the team and just working with a lot of my mentors and a lot of my um, people who've inspired me in my, in my work. And so I just want to briefly introduce them. And I think they're all, one thing that connects us all, we're a very transdisciplinary team. We kind of all bring very many different things to the table. And one thing that connects us all, I think, is we're, we're innovators in our practice. So I remember, um, um, so uh, Dr. Francis Gilbert is over here. And the first time I met you, Francis, I don't know if you remember this, it was on the PG, the Postgraduate Certificate in Higher Education. And you started the session by doing some meditation. And I really liked that. It was such a nice way to like land in the space. And it, and it wasn't really the convention to start um, sessions with a meditation. And I really liked it because you just brought back and it was just like, yeah, cool. So that was the first time I met you. Um, Kimberly Foster, uh, who's been working with Bridget, is just such a, she, when we started doing sessions on Zoom, she would, she got people to make a little diorama out of their Zoom camera, um, and make, they made these little scenes kind of in their little Zoom camera with a little cardboard thing over the, over the camera, um, it was such innovative practice, and so um, she always brings such enthusiasm and freshness to our sessions. Um, Tom Mansfield, who was working with me on the project, I met him um, doing performance artwork in Copenhagen, where we invented a, a new science of psychochromatics, blending red and, red and blue to make purple. Uh, and one of Tom's little games to make more purple thinking is, which I'm going to do with you now, and in your head, I'd like you to say quickly, slowly. Yeah. That's purple thinking. Um, now say softly, loudly, in your head. Those are some examples of purple thinking, the made-up science of psychochromatics blending red and blue thinking. And it's like our logo. It is like your logo. <laughs> there we go. All just... <laughs> um, uh, Bridget McKenzie, who's the founder of Climate Museum UK, she's just here. And Bridget and I met in the Creative Ecologies of New Cross Gates at open mic nights, playing music together. Um, and Bridget, one of the things that really inspires me about Bridget is the distributed organisation that is Climate Museum UK. Um, it's very much um, people bring what they want to it. And there's a very um, non-hierarchical organisation. It's something I've read a lot about, but I've not seen it done very much. And so Bridget does that so beautifully. And um, yes, she's a real, uh, very supportive mentor for me. Uh, and then finally, Miranda, who I've been working with on the, um, uh, in the Department of Educational Studies for the last seven years now. It's pretty amazing. And when I first started doing it as an associate lecturer here, I had no idea what I was doing, no training, just sort of got the job by a text. I probably shouldn't say that. Um, and uh, not from you. <laughs> um, and yeah, it was just like, I've been so, so well supported by Miranda over, this, over these last seven years. And this was a really exciting project to do this together. It's been really, really cool. So thank you. And I'm gonna hand over now to Miranda Matthews. Thank you, Kevin. So yes, we've been really fortunate to all work together this year on this project, the Participatory Arts Methods for Engaging Young People in Climate Research project. And all three of us who are here are gonna present something about this project and what we've done on it. So um, of our research team, there's myself, Bridget and Kevin here. So, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the context, the intentions, uh, research designs, methods, approaches, practice research and participants. We'll find out a little bit later about difficulties and discoveries in practice research and key points for empowering young people in the earth crisis via participatory arts methods. And hopefully you'll find some synergies, those of you who were uh, listening to the presentations or presenting yesterday with your own um, explorations and findings. So the Centre for Arts and Learning, Ecologies and Practice Research started really in 2021. As Head of Centre for Arts and Learning, I uh, have a kind of 
well, I have remit to decide what my annual research theme is going to be about. And I see what's happening in the world and I kind of find out what I think the next year is going to be really important for. So, uh, so Ecologists in Practice came in then and it was just at the start of uh, the whole COP26 and all the you know, massive delegates gathering there. And we had some wonderful presentations. So uh, these are some just some little snapshots from the presentations and our first Ecologies in Practice Symposium, where Erin um, Manning came in and presented Out of the Clear, which is now published as a book and in a reading group currently in, in our MIT, uh, led by David Russell on posthumanism. So that book is already out there. Dennis Atkinson came in and he talked about uh, Isabel Stengers and ecologies of practice. So there's a slight difference there between ecologies in practice and ecologies of practice. And essentially, I suppose, because I've asked about this in a book proposal that we've put in, that um, I've been asked about it rather, is that a difference is that it's about what's found out through practice research. Uh, ecologies in practice are happening in practice. And this is why um, and in our blend of presentations, we have academics, we also have artists, we have curators, we have people who are outside the academic realm who are coming into these presentations to talk about how they're putting ecologies into practice, but also to explore their research narratives that come up. And the research narrative is the whole thing that builds that context of practice research, the inquiry and the question. So we, uh, one of the uh, groups that we worked with was um, filmmaker Maren Cielo, and they made a whole film from scratch with absolutely zero waste. So even the clothes that people wore were kind of hand-me-down um, charity shop donations and everything on the set was solar powered and wind powered. Um, so, uh, so that, that was also you know, really important for us. And then the, you can see here the greenhouse theater at the top. The Greenhouse Theatre, again, do everything with zero waste. Their whole um, uh, organisation is made from scratch, from donated bits of materials. And on the left over here, you can see a, uh, an image of a fungi because this whole concept of mycorrhizal connection was really coming into play then. And we had the Arts Research Learning Group, who are a group of alumni students from the MA Arts and Learning who presented then. Uh, but also around all of this time, we were making the connections with Climate Museum UK and Bridget McKenzie because Bridget did our first keynote presentation for this uh, way before the symposium. And at that point, we were starting to build our collaboration and connection. So all through that whole year, um, we had continuing events. This was the second Ecologies in Practice Symposium that we had last summer and a range of different speakers came in. So um, mixing in formal education and non-formal education. So Henrietta Patience was working with people in schools. I was doing ecologies in practice with undergraduate students. And uh, Andy Ash came in from UCL, Ben Parry from Bath Spa University. Um, we had our PhD art and learning students also presenting for that Ecologies in Practice Symposium. And although our PhD students are particularly focused and zoomed in on their, um, on their inquiry, they looked at issues of sustainability and, and ecology as they related to their own inquiries. So uh, these intentions, I have praised them slightly. I'm going to try and make it not too texty, um, are from the Arts and Humanities Research Council bid that we put in for this project. So when we go back and review at the end of the year, we have to say how we've met our intentions. And we were really wanting to, at this point, bring young people into the research process. And that uh, a lot of uh, the kind of, let's say, um, uh, grassroots, uh, ground up, groundswell activity is from young people and the anger is from young people, the wish for climate action is from young people um, who see it as their futures that are being destroyed by adults. So uh, there was also a lot of eco-anxiety amongst young people with the school international school strikes and uh, seeing the changes in their world and not being able to, feeling like they were disempowered to do anything about it. So we set out to bring in young people and uh, produce uh, 
arts methods to research that would also enable empowerment and voice for them in a kind of shared knowledge of cultural ecologies. So our project, the one that we've done this year, has been very intensive and we've been working with uh, from three pairs of practitioners working together essentially. Sometimes there have been changes in the pairs as Kevin introduced the whole research team and so I worked with Francis Gilbert on uh, free writing and drawing that became focused and expressive writing and drawing in the course of, course of the workshops. And uh, Kevin and Tom worked on uh, sound and movement, Bridget and Kimberly worked on dialogical objects. And uh, so we had this whole kind of sequence of events happening in quite an intense way for school students that came into Goldsmiths. Um, so, however, we wanted that for the young people to be able to take away what they've learned with us into their experiences in schools so that it didn't kind of just stop at the oh, this is only practicable in a funded research project in a university, but that they could take away these methods and use them outside in their own contexts. And um, hopefully to generate some freedom and some ability for them in those contexts in the process. So uh, there's, there's a, this was part of our statement and it's come in during the process of research around climate justice, around the experiences of young people uh, in the kind of context of the cost of living crisis and people not having enough to eat and young people going to schools not having enough to eat and this whole concept of local global food systems. So our pedagogies had to be built around quite a tense time for young people in the local schools that we were working with that were all working at all had intakes of diverse groups of people. So our adaptive pedagogies were, were, were intended to be nourishing and to connect with the Climate Museum K's collection of objects that reference those conditions as well. So uh, we wanted to develop ongoing cultural ecologies and to make contact with partner organizations, potential connections, and this is another reason why we have the conference. Um, we're networking amongst everybody because uh, there's so many fantastic projects going on that we would like to be able to continue the synergies uh, in the next stage of our ecologies in practice. So our research design, uh, because the methodology is really important in the way, uh, it was very tight, it was very intensive, but we wanted to enable within that some uh, fluidity for change. So we had three workshops. The first workshop was with school students, the second with undergraduate students and the third with school students. And uh, in between the workshops, we reviewed and evaluated what had happened. We thought about what went well. We discovered uh, things about ourselves as practitioners and the ways that we either kind of pocketed off what we did or how we could interconnect and, and learn from each other in the process. So um, that, was, that was really important. And the undergraduate students group, although it was really small, were actually vital because they came in and they totally kind of altered in a way our approach. Um, our theoretical approach because uh, we've been working with indirect pedagogies um, and a Severo works with those indirect pedagogies so that we weren't kind of going in on the top of the young people with sort of protest heavy messages and that we were working with them to see what came out in the nuances of the arts methods that we were working with. However, when we started working with the undergraduates, they said, this is not enabling us to grapple with climate change. We don't feel this is meaningful enough. So um, I'll talk about this later. It can be as a cliffhanger. So then um, we had mixed qualitative practice research and, and, and qualitative methods and practice research. In a way, um, people have looked at our bid who work with practice research and said, well, this isn't purely practice research. It isn't, but there, there are a lot of kind of processes that you have to go through where validity around qualitative methods is considered. So we, we kind of weighed up how we would approach our methods and included both. And um, then we had focus groups after each of the workshops 
and surveys. The surveys produce less rich data than the focus groups, as always. And then we had um, researcher reflections. So um, if I may just have a little bit of time, I'm just going to show you our website, which you may have seen already. And um, this was designed by the wonderful Jess Farr, who is an incredible website designer. And we sent all of our research data and information to Jess, and she created this website. So it's one of our research outputs, and it's out there already in the public domain before we published anything on the project. And in this, we do talk through our intentions and we talk through a little bit what happened in the project. So if you want to have a look at that, if you have your own device at home um, or you have it with you, it's, it's very simple to get onto ecoartslearning.net. So um, as each of us is going to talk a little bit about our methods, I'm just going to go straight to drawing and writing on the creative methods. And um, so this website has really helped us in kind of integrating practice research methods and outputs as equal kind of equal contributions, let's say, in research. So we have video content, we have sound content, we have imagery, we have the poetic content. Um, that poetic analysis that Helen Carr did yesterday is going to be brilliant, I think, for analysing that because Francis brought in poems. So uh, initially, the young people had examples of my 10 minute drawings. It really was very intense in the type of time that they had. So I had to practice what I could make in 10 minutes to see what they could do. And uh, and sometimes they they did much better than I expected they would do, obviously, because they the school students are used to working in those conditions. The undergraduate students are less so. They have a bit more time just to uh, spaciously develop and reflect on practice than school students do. So um, so they made collaborative drawings. You can you, you can see them on the top of the website doing that. That is where they're using the, the pens and the pencils, um, ecological recycled pens and pencils, let's say, to create uh, create their, their work. And uh, what one of the synergies we found was embodiment. So that the noise of the pens and the pencils and the, the movement across the paper was really important. And that had been part of kind of Kevin's method, the sound and movement. So these synergies amongst the methods were built as the students moved between one method and another. And, and so after the drawings, Francis came in and he did, uh, he, well, he read a poem initially, and then the young people created their own poem in a, in a bit of time for free writing that then became focused expressive writing. And these are some examples on the website of things that they created, um, some lovely poetic texts that they created which are their own artworks. So uh, also our website gathers reflections and feedback from the students. And this comes from the, uh, the focus groups, from the transcriptions of the focus groups. So um, just, just to kind of show that there. Now I'm going to minimize the website. And I think it's handing over to Bridget now, if that's okay. Miranda. So, hello everyone. So I'm going to talk about um, our part of the, um, well, I'm gonna talk about Climate Museum UK more generally, and some of the kind of research and thoughts that we brought to the collaboration. But I'm also gonna talk a little bit as well about um, the particular um, third, of the work that we did, that I did with Kimberly, exploring um, dialogic processes around objects. Um, so in doing that, I'll kind of focus a bit on what it means to be a museum. Um, but what really um, interests me about this project, I was excited to be able to come into this collaboration because I've been driven for quite a while um, with an interest to explore, I'll just read out these questions. Um, what kinds of arts learning provision are radical enough to do justice to young people in the context of the earth crisis and their limited expectations of safe futures? 
And so how do we design arts learning experiences? Okay. <laughs> How do we design arts learning experiences that are collapse aware without shutting down imagination and creative potential? Um, and is there an effective balance between informing learners about this complex and troubling situation and then enabling generative inquiry and expressive art um, while being aware of very different needs of age cohorts and individuals? So, you know, that kind of design challenge um, really, really inspires and interests me. Um, so yes, I'll talk about Climate Museum UK as an experiment, some research that informed this project on how we engage young people with the earth crisis, and then dialogic play with objects and how does it enable voice. But I just want to briefly mention the term earth crisis. It's a term that we use as a shorthand within Climate Museum UK. It's a sort of, um, we, we're developing a kind of shared vocabulary. And the, the term Earth crisis might be called meta crisis or poly crisis, but I insist on the word Earth being in there because if the environment is not a, a specific topic or you know, a separate issue from any other issue, we live you know, on a biosphere and the histories of extraction Ex exploitation, you know, of separation from nature are, are essentially the root causes of all the inequalities that affect humans and the more than human world. So, um, you know, essentially the big, big issue is the earth crisis. Of course, climate change is part of that, but, but I really try to avoid using climate change as a synecdoche or a coverall for the earth crisis. So, that sort of like principle laid down. So Climate Museum UK, I founded it um, uh, three years ago with others, but, um, but you know, I suppose I'm the driving person behind it. Um, we're an experimental museum. We don't have a single um, base. We're not aiming to create uh, a single museum with a, with a kind of single defined collection. Um, we're exploring methodologies of curating and gathering emerging responses to the earth crisis as it happens. So it's a very much a contemporary kind of museum, um, but it does also, it, it's museum-like in that we are thinking historically, we're thinking in terms of time and histories. We're a team of creative people distributed across the UK. Um, quite a lot of us are based in London. Um, I'm based in Norfolk and we're, I'm building a big cluster of people around me in Norfolk. But um, essentially, we're aiming to, you know, distribute across the country with clusters of practice in, in various places. So we make and we gather art, objects, ideas, games and books, and we use them in activations to help people to play, make, think or talk about the Earth crisis and to open their imaginations to possible futures. So rather than a standard kind of museum or the traditional museum is about um, their, their operations are about collecting and then showing things, whereas our emphasis is on people and how they might become activated in this wider context of the earth crisis. And things are just used as part of that. And in some ways, we don't value those things as much as a museum might, you know, they're, they're to be used and handled and played with or, or created. So it's a, it's a generative museum as much as it is about collecting existing things. So yeah, we theorize that effective activations are dialog dialogic conversations with creative stimuli and objects. So the conversations might be verbal and nonverbal, um, but you know, it's about bringing people together to, um, to respond to objects and those objects might actually be you know, existing in the world around us. So we might, for example, well, I, for example, use my city, Norwich as a museum, so I don't need to collect things, it's all there. <laughs> um, it's about saying the world is a museum. Um, so the creative stimuli um, might be pre-existing or, or generated. So for example, on the left, that um, image there, uh, you can see some of us are dressed up as animals. We were animal curators. This was the Wild Museum, Lucy there, who's one of our directors was um, a badger. So she had a collection of, um, 
of stuff to do with coal mining. Um, uh, we each had our own collections that were reflecting the, the histories of that, of that site, which was actually at the Timber Festival in the National Forest, which had been a coal mine and a landfill site. So we were exploring the histories of extraction. And then we provided some clay to the children and said, right, now generate a wild museum and let's leave the clay objects that you've made in, in the forest. So that's an example of how dialogic conversations unfold through creativity and, and handling and making of objects. Um, so in general, I'm really interested in experimental cultural practice or another term might be imagination activism, how we bring imagination into generating future worlds and stopping harm. And so some of the principles of that or outcomes might be about enabling declaration. So for example, that's um, uh, a movement I've been part of for a very long time um, is the art not oil movement. So that's you know resisting uh, fossil fuel sponsorship of culture. Resistance, so you know, pointing out how things are, are wrong and refusing to do them, walking out, like for example, I walked out as um, a member of the Tate um, as an act of resistance. Um, clarity of voice, so, um, and clarity doesn't have to mean always being very denotative. It means a combination of denotation and connotation. And you can see here the, the launch of uh, Culture Declares Emergency, which is a movement I've co-founded. And this you know, performative, spectacular launch included multiple poetic readings at various points across the city. So um, it's that combination of poetry and, and, and clarity of statement about what's going wrong. So those are the kind of voices that we might want to generate in the creative work that we do. So um, being informed by research is important. So Climate Outreach did research last year on young people and climate. They found that young people, just like adults, are affected by these media discourses that minimise and deflect the crisis. Um, and they lack understanding of climate justice or global reparative thinking. Um, but more than adults, they reject, on the whole, they reject narratives of climate as a future problem for the young to sort out. They reject the complacency of adults who have the means to make a difference. And they expect to be told truths and often express truths in quite direct and blunt ways. So this raises questions, you know, about how do they respond to the arts about the crisis? And as Miranda said, the graduates, um, the undergrads who were involved in this project said, you know, you're not being direct enough. <laughs> you're not making clear what we're here for. And um, I'm working on a current uh, theatre project where we've got a group of older artists, including me, uh, some, some young people people and some refugees and asylum seekers the young people don't want any of that elusive kind of arts crap you know <laughs> what they want to do is to make a film about veganism and it includes um you know um images of animal slaughter and this is kind of raising quite you know the older people are kind of oh that's a bit you know it's a bit harsh it's a bit direct but you know the young people are saying you know tell the truth us as adults might say tell it slant but so, you know, this is maybe a kind of relational intergenerational challenge for us to work through. So um, Climate Museum UK did some research two years ago for a new direction, who are the sort of uh, arts learning agency in London. Um, we listened to young people and cultural educators about the role of cultural learning in the earth crisis. And young people said, don't bracket it out quite often climate or nature are you know, set aside and um, assumed to be sometimes too difficult. They're not understood as the context in which we're all living. We have to carefully design ways to explore those difficulties. They don't want young people to be pigeonholed or burdened as echo warriors. You can't assume that young people naturally have an ability to speak, to speak um, because they often lack confidence to speak because they don't feel they know enough. They don't feel they've been taught enough. Um, and it's an incredibly complex area and they need knowledge in order to feel confident to speak outside. Um, well, actually, you know, with, with anyone really. 
Um, there are many reasons why they might not even want to speak to peers about it. Um, and so with adults as well, we as cultural educators, we need trauma sensitive support to help, you know, because we're also going through the traumas of the earth crisis. We are often parents, we care for the children that we work with. So um, meaningful youth voice requires profound awareness of needs of, of, of intergenerationally. So in Climate Museum, we have a principle called being positopian. Um, as an imagination practice. It's a unique principle and it's an approach to future thinking that expands the possible future, drawing on the physical realities of the trouble we're in, but also imagining the multiple possibilities of a better future. Five minutes time. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, great. So um, We've been exploring and applying this in projects like this one with Goldsmiths, but also another one working with the Norfolk and Norwich Festival um, called Imagine Futures. And this is about, um, this has been about trialing and exploring different arts led approaches um, for young people to imagine their own futures. So it's partly about imagining futures of, of the city in, in a planetary system. Um, and through that, learning the opportunities for future work. And we've really tried hard not to create um, limited views on what, what future work might be. It's not like there are lots of jobs in green tech. It's more like if all of these unpredictable changes are happening, what does that mean for our futures? You know, and actually it means much more, much more um, um, uh, focus on uh, compassion and, um, and emotional literacy. Um, so in this day long experimental workshop we did, um, the young people played five different roles um, which have been illustrated here. And so the one on the top right that has a heart for a head was a kind of um, um, a sort of uh, in, inter, uh, interdisciplinary kind of weaver of well-being. So they're somebody who works across health and social care and education and all sorts of modes to try to advocate for the importance of well-being in all the decisions we make. So that's just an example of a future role. So all of the young people got into groups and they rotated around these different roles that were being modelled by emerging practitioners. So in Climate Museum, we have um, a network of younger practitioners and we give them opportunities opportunities, paid opportunities to experience this kind of facilitation work. Um, and an another example is Once Upon a Planet, where we worked in partnership with the Tully House Museum and Art Gallery. Um, and we had, we recruited together a young artist, Megan Bauer, who was a, in residence there in the Lake District. And she was playing with objects. She dove into the archives, combined things, um, um, contributed to an exhibition, and created challenges for the wider public. Um, and as part of that, we did training for all of the staff um, and uh, supported a, a, a youth panel to be formed. And Megan is now a, an associate with us. So um, just, to con just to come now finally to the project, the part of this Ecologies in Practice project that I worked on, um, which was about dialogic conversations around objects. So I was working with Kimberly. Kimberly and I worked together 20 years ago when I was head of learning at the British Library. Okay. Um, and I commissioned, we commissioned her to make object dialogue boxes that would help us interpret the very difficult collections. And that has been a really important part of her practice over 20 years with her partner, Carl Foster as well. But um, so what we did was that we had a combination of objects. Mine were handling objects that were um, un, um, <laughs> they weren't, they weren't artist made, they were found. They were things like packaging, newspapers, toys. Um, and so we first of all modeled how you might map the meanings around these objects in ways that were a mix of, um, of personal and um, uh, denotative. Um, and for example, we had a, I had a shoe last. So both Kimberly and I live in Norwich, and the shoes are the shoe lasts, which is a structure for making shoes, comes from the 
the industry of shoemaking. And Norwich used to have 15 shoe factories, but now there are none because it's moved to China. And, and so we talked about, you know, the um, um, consumerism and mass production. So a lot of our collections were about materials and consumption. And then we introduced Kimberley's artworks. And you can see here how mapping the meanings of those, you know, they really took off. It was like, you know, multiple different questions like, do trees speak? If trees speak, what could they say? Um, and it was lovely to see Suzanne Dhaliwal's artwork yesterday where she created an artwork where you, um, a, a loudspeaker was reverse engineered so you could hear nature, which is, or so that you could really listen. Anyway, um, yeah, and also look, a hit, um, sort of an ear in a shell and that led to questions like, can the, the creatures that live in shells, can they hear? Um, uh, and what are they hearing and, and what do they want to say to us? So it was a very much about more than human um, communication. Um, and two other artworks here that you can see, you can look at these on the website too. Um, these were introduced in the second and third sessions because Kimberly couldn't make all of them at once. So there's a, a drum that, that has been embroidered with um, capillaries that suggest co coral or, um, or lungs, there's no single meaning to these, of course, they're kind of multi, uh, yeah, multiple connotations. And then um, a sort of dustpan and brush that conveys something to do with um, uh, ocean waste and floats. Um, so yeah, the young people were like really challenged to think that objects don't have to have single meanings. It helps them develop complexity thinking, systems thinking. And, and, and we really found that that combination of, of practicing with ordinary found objects and then kind of opening the imagination with these much less denotative objects was, was really profound. But Miranda's going to carry on talking about the... Oh, you're yeah. going to carry on about your... Okay, sorry. Could I... Bridget. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Bridget. That was great. Um, I've got five minutes to tell you about what we did on our sound and movement things. Um, first of all, we're going to listen to this sound. So this is of sign before the stars. It's a composition formed and um, produced by data from the primordial universe. So before there were stars, the, 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 the sound waves that have come, someone's gathered them, Jeff Talman, and turned them into this composition. And we use lots of these kind of immersive sounds to try and communicate ideas to the, to the students. And, and create a sense of wonder and perspective, stepping outside of a human-centric perspective. This is another way of stepping outside of a human-centric perspective. Um, and trying to connect with more than human perception. Here's a little game to highlight ecological thinking. And the the question is, which two of these go together? And if you focus on objects or parts, then the chicken and the cow go together because they're both animals. But if you focus on relationships, then the cow and the grass go together because they're in a relationship. And this highlights ecological thinking, which could be um, described this way. So the role of interactions in a system rather than the parts. I love the title of that book, Thinking Like a Tree. So our workshop design uh, had four parts to it. So I'm gonna briefly go through. So first of all, we played some games which embodied ecological thinking. 
on the left hand side, the students, I don't know if you can see, they're all holding a cup by holding a thread that's attached to the cup. So all five of them are holding the cup connected through this web and they have to build a tower of cups in that way. And on the right hand side, you've kind of got like a, a complex system of nodes represented by chairs and there's one empty chair and you can see me there trying to sit down in the empty chair and all the other students have to block me. So this student here is wanting to sit down in that chair to stop me sitting down. That creates a new empty chair. So then I walk towards the new empty chair and then they have to sit, sit down to stop me sitting down there. And what, they, what the game teaches them is that the solution is at the other side of the network. Because initially you think, oh, I'll, I'll sit in the chair because I'm near the chair. But that's the wrong way to play the game. You've got to sit, you've got to, your solutions at the other end of the network. And I love the way that the, the message this game carries. So we played those games to sort of like, if we're gonna do ecological thinking, I feel like it's a good idea to like embody that or move as a network together. Then we um, had an immersive sound experience with silent disco headphones and a microphone, which was on me and also mic micing up the whole table. So we explored different ways of listening and, and more than human ways of listening. If we all now put our fingertips just on the back of our um, sort of uh, just behind our ears here and gently hum to yourself. Mm. This is how crickets listen in inverted commas by sensing the vib sound vibrations through their bones. And um, so we can, we can sort of tap into like a more than human way of listening before there was listening as we know it. Now, uh, we also use this as a spider web so we could tap the table just like a spider senses movement through, the, through its movement of its web, the table was mic'd up. So when we tap the table, we communicate with each other as if it was a spider's web. Then we started to map out the ideas using Tom's Cards for Life, which I introduced yesterday. Uh, and some of the students would like create these really amazing maps of different uh, uh, ways of connecting the cards. And then finally, there's different ways of expression, either by um, uh, through, through drawing, um, through recording discussions. So we record a lot of discussions the students had about why they'd map the cards in the way they had. And some of them then converted the, signs, the cards back into a sound, which was like a representation of their ideas. And that's me done. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> So, uh, as I said at the cliffhanger, that we, we were discussing these difficulties and discoveries in practice research. And we are, you know, often working with critical pedagogies as art and design educators. And this idea of problem posing is a big, uh, important thing for us. So, if we find a difficulty in our research, it doesn't have to be stymieing or blocking or irritating. It can be, okay, how can we work with this? And how can we see this happening for young people as well when they're experiencing those issues? So um, one of the things that we found difficulties with was this idea of time. And there's another whole conference coming up and a, a journal that I, uh, I'm an editor for, iJade, which is on time. And one of the things that is a big issue for young people is not having enough time to do what they want to do. So we had to have a carousel of activities. Now, anybody who's ever taught in a secondary school uh, will be familiar with this idea of carousel, which is you have the same amount of time to do each of the methods and then you move on. So when we started off, the artists were in the perspective that they were going to have a whole day to do their method with the young people. And of course we didn't, so we, didn't, we couldn't do that. Because we were working with young people aged 14 to 18 in schools, they're in exam groups. So we could only get them out of schools for half a day. And I mean, the, the benefits of this were that they were used to having short amounts of time. That sad thing is, is that often in schools now, their art lessons are only like 50 minutes. 45 50 minutes so that when we had 45 minutes to do our arts methods and it was like a carousel of 45 minutes with one 45 minutes with the next 45 minutes with the third they sadly were used to that so because they experienced it in schools and didn't find it too untoward um however 
the, um, the, the young people, or the, they are still young people, of course, the undergraduate students who have had this space to spread out, were saying to us in the free writing and drawing, well, this isn't free, is it? You know, I mean, this, this is like, you know, we've got five minutes to do this, 10 minutes to do that. That's not freedom. So it's, we then had to kind of think about uh, redirecting our approach towards what happened in practice. And it became less about the indirect pedagogies that we started with and more about critical pedagogies, which are empowering, humanizing, enabling voice, conscientization, those words that were coming up yesterday um, in terms of conscientization of a decolonial perspective as well, began beginning with Paulo Freire, of course. So, and then going on to bell hooks and other critical pedagogy theorists. So we kind of moved from a more sort of uh, ambient and nuanced and indirect uh, post-humanist philosophical approach towards a pretty direct critical pedagogy you have some space to protest now and to let this out to let out your feelings about loss of di bi biodiversity extractivism all of these issues that are affecting people so however we often say in research that we don't ever kind of find an answer concluding answer to a question and we haven't we don't feel like we've concluded this research anyway but we have better questions emerging. So uh, adapting to the pressurized time spaces that young people have and uh, sharing knowledges of what's happening in pedagogy and practice for synergies and consistency. So we found that, um, I'll get onto this in the next slide as well, that we were trying to communicate too much information. We were trying to tell young people a lot of you know, incredibly valuable things that um, Bridget brings into the Climate Museum. And then Francis wanted to focus on air pollution and I wanted to focus on loss of biodiversity. And it was just too much for the young people to take in all at once. So we had to kind of say, okay, well, to make this more meaningful as, and interactive as an experience, we have to really focus on the collaboration. And the, the young people were saying it, you know, it's more about collaboration, this, isn't it? And so we then sort of honed down and, made more combined and after the the second workshop uh, I came up with an ethos content and references document so sorry before the second workshop which all of the practitioners added to so we all had literally the same page of information to to share and work work amongst each other how we were going to approach the next workshop so that's just to share something one of the difficulties uh, and and yes, still to be uh, ethical in what we did, because we're all educators and yet we're trying to find things out from young people. So there is a kind of paradox there in that we're sort of teaching them information and yet trying to hear from them at the same time without kind of overly formatively shaping what they say. So that tension still comes up for educators working with educational practice research. Uh, and hopefully the what happens for them after in schools. I've had some feedback from the teachers who are saying that it's sort of reverberating around their schools, the project. So hopefully that will continue. Um, so key findings and uh, I'm hoping to leave enough time for questions. But in terms of key findings. And um, here are some of them. So. This came from Bridget, that we need to put more attention on the causes and less on the impacts of the earth crisis to empower more artivism or activism, whichever term you want to put it, because that's where the energy is. And, and I kind of said this at the start of the conference that Bridget's approach and our approach in relation to Bridget is one of positivity, that there is still, still time to do something and to go to the causes and and to stop the causes happening is one of the key approaches to preventing the eco-anxiety around the impacts. So uh, a lot of the young people said, we anticipated it, but a lot of the young people were saying that bringing in arts methods enables sensory expression in addition to the scientific knowledges that they're given at schools and the kind of written and recorded ways they're expected to express themselves around those. And those were appreciated. So. Uh, we found that, say, the innovative new arts experiences, say, that Kevin brought in, Kevin and Tom brought in, um, 
uh, were combined with, say, what could be seen as adapted traditional approaches. So the free writing and drawing things that they has, that are seen as valid in schools uh, were, were enabling some forms of takeaways. So that, that's a kind of still a sort of problematic that we're working with, how to enable takeaways to happen across all of the three methods. So the synergies gathering among the three methods are cumulative and one might expect that. So uh, as young people go from one method to the next, they bring their expertise and their experience of the previous method into the new method. And that kind of gathers as an importance for them. So um, like with any kind of organization of an event, uh, or a workshop, there has to be really careful timing to comfort to timing, um, careful attention to timing, interaction process. There were lots of hoops to jump through in terms of health and safety. So uh, everything that looks as though it's a spontaneous experience for young people is actually really not. Um, and that's something just to remember that, you know, although we're trying to get a sense of freedom and spontaneity in what we do, there's such a lot that, of background planning and research that goes into them having that experience. So I'm just going to now uh, open the floor to questions a bit. We've got just a few minutes before our planned break time. So we might go into it for a couple of minutes, just depending on how many questions there are. Um, Can I just say a little bit about the very final finding? Yes. Um, that um, I guess we had to um, cater for a certain number. You know, there was a quantitative, uh, maybe not a target, but with, with all cultural projects, you know, we, if they're funded, we have to show that we reached a certain number of people. Yeah. And that maybe a, a more ideal um, project would have um, had just one group at a time experiencing all three rather than them being like a, a, a carousel. So that we could then all be part of the the chain of, of experience and that and that they would be sequential so you know because they all experienced a different order of events um and that was tricky <laughs> yeah so, yeah it, it, yeah it was and um it wasn't something that in terms of our research findings that we could actually get into how do these different sequences how are they recorded how how does that happen but we're trying to pick that up from our findings as well uh yeah we would have needed at least six days wouldn't we with yeah. six schools um, and yeah. and that wasn't covered in our it wouldn't be unless you had a much bigger kind of pot to, to go with but what was an absolute luxury for us which doesn't ever really happen in schools or universities to have a team of six people working in the same room at the same time you know that that's kind of very rare now within education so it felt like a great luxury although it was a short amount of time and um, so um right so any questions coming in in the chat Do you want to come up, up here? Question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> boring question, fire away. <laughs> I feel like boring questions are so can come up as well if you like intertwined with what we can actually achieve in process. How is Climate Within UK funded? <laughs> <laughs> Only by the project funding right, okay. that we receive. So it, the money goes out again onto freelancers. So do you exist as a charity? As a CIC. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's several hands going up. I don't know if you're the chair, Miranda. <laughs> but anyway. Um, I, I want to thank you very much for this uh, hugely interesting and inspiring study, particularly with the last few days on the workshops. And I wondered whether you could share a few things that the students were doing. Well, on our website, I mean, this isn't literally taken by the students, but we've created resources for schools. So, or, or school students. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that was one of the things we said we'd do so that each method has a distilled resource that we've created for schools to download. And we also have a, a group leader's guide that was 
absolutely essential for mm -hmm. teachers and teaching assistants who brought their groups of secondary school students to Goldsmiths to know what they were doing in advance and then also to see what they could do afterwards with lots of links to related artworks and projects and, and resources. So in terms of what school students took away though, literally what they took away, it, it varied. Some of them said that they wanted to do things like, um, they work with objects or uh, some of them, they absolutely loved Kevin's um, sound and movement, all of them you know there were no criticisms criticisms about sound and movement we did have to take a little bit of flack about writing and drawing um <laughs> our writing is boring you know occasionally it doesn't say this on our website but in terms of um uh what they took away a lot of them then, then said oh well we could we could do free writing at school we could do that or we could do more free drawing we could do that so it was opening up a space of freedom in a way, or um, people don't like that word a lot now because freedom is associated with freedom for some and not for others in many cases, but it opened up a space of self-expression, let's say, which they could expand into a bit more in schools. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think you were first. Uh, I, I, okay, okay. <laughs> I'd be interested to know if there's any like pleasant or unpleasant surprises or with the students or things you, that really just revealed sort of backgrounds to people, some people not believing it, for example. Or... Yeah. Can I just yeah. say quickly? So I think probably our one of the three was probably the most about the Earth crisis, you know, about um, probably a little bit more um, trying to to get them speaking and, and sharing knowledge. And quite often I was just really dismayed at the lack of knowledge, um, but it did, it did underpin those, those earlier findings, but it still felt, felt dismaying, you know, oh God, there's so much, you know, that we need to help them understand. So for example, um, we had an orangutan toy and all of the night, um, you know, multiple groups thought it was a monkey and didn't have any knowledge of the relationship between orangutans and uh, palm oil and deforestation. So, you know, I just assume, put it in and they'll immediately assume the, the connotations, but it, it, they weren't there. So, yeah. Yeah, so those kind of assumptions, because Bridget has an immense wealth of knowledge around this issue, and uh, it was difficult with the young people, some of whom didn't have any. Um, some of them, however, were working in school already on projects that around climate crisis and earth crisis, and it really um, contributed well to those school projects. I've asked to see their artwork, their outcomes, but I've been told you can't see them until the autumn term. So, um, but, but yes, there, there are real synergies. And, and obviously, because this is such an issue for young people, schools are starting to bring it into their curriculum more. Yeah. I thought there was a huge range of knowledge amongst different students, some of whom were really impressive, what they knew, and some knew very little. And I feel like the open-endedness of the activities allowed for that because it meant it wasn't and one thing they were supposed to do. It was just like it took a lot of space for all those things. And we were there to support them wherever they were at. Yeah, I was being too blanket in my description of no <laughs> knowledge. It wasn't like that. Mm. Oh, mm. you're right. It was yeah. diversity. Yeah. I've got a question in the chat. So somebody, um, Emma, saying she's writing a dissertation on the role of action in eco-anxiety at the moment. Is there a paper for our study to use to cite our findings currently not emma because uh we it's just we're in the process of the project still we're just sort of wrapping it up but what you can cite is our website that's already uh, a practice research output in the public domain so if you want to cite that that's that's okay and we have a forthcoming book an edited book in um uh palgrave macmillan it's pretty much certain but I, I'm not saying that please don't quote me on it but we've had very good reviews back and and so a number of our presenters in this conference will have chapters in that book too including this project I've got yeah. a few articles if you get in touch <laughs> with me and Bridget also has some articles yeah. uh, that she's she's put together and blogs mm -hmm. uh, that she's put together during the course of the project yeah about working with the art and science curriculum. So 
like your which obviously come in sort of outside the curriculum student study so what kind of um potential do you think there is for geography teachers biology teachers art teachers history teachers english literature how much capacity is there sam and i project we're going to present on but we were talking to people in wells and apparently they're starting to do a more thematic kind of approach to curriculum so yeah was there any since, since you've been like on the ground that that's a possibility or did you just need to parachute in and do your more interdisciplinary work uh the yeah. arts is a is an interdisciplinary exactly. subject area that enables reach across all of those subjects sorry Miranda no I think that's yeah. I think that's exactly right um there there's a big drive towards interdisciplinary creativity mm -hmm. towards steam which is the science and technology engineering and maths but including arts as well so this is all uh, in high focus in schools and definitely in universities too, a lot of our undergraduate students will be doing electives where they uh, can choose modules that are science focused or arts focused, even if they're in a in a different kind of degree setting too. So the knowledge uh, is that actually people benefit from, say, using maybe using arts methods such as free writing and drawing in any kind of study discipline, whatever they're focusing on. Same with working with objects to get hold of the materiality of the subject that they're working with, uh, listening and attuning your different senses. Uh, these are all um, arts methods that are of great use. And you can you can read my book, Arts Methods for the Self-Representation of Undergraduate <laughs> Students, that came out this year, if you like, to demonstrate how that's happening on a, an interdisciplinary basis. Right, we um, I've got a question from Jess. Uh, so, or is it more, uh, yeah, those are questions. Some environmental youth support and education orgs she works alongside have identified a crisis in youth democratic engagement in the education system as a barrier to learning about the earth crisis. Is this an issue your project noticed or addressed? Yeah, it is from the start of our focus groups, because our first question was, what will you do after this project in your schools to take away? And the students couldn't say anything. They just sat there because they were with their teachers and their teachers were there and they didn't know what they would be allowed to do. And then the teachers came, would, would have to kind of frame the response. Um, well, actually we're doing this in this project and we're doing that. So we, yeah, we, we did come across that, that um, democratic voice is constructed within the school systems. And, and that is quite a clear observation, but um, that's across all the subject areas. It's, it's just how it, how it happens. Uh, unless, and even if they're doing subjects such as philosophy for children, it's still within the topics that are created within the schools and, and with those resources. I'm mindful that our people in the room need a comfort break. Mm -hmm. um, before we go on to our next presentation, our keynote presentation. So I'm going to put us on to break now, if that's okay, everybody online, just um for so we we're, we're planning to, to reconvene at twenty to twenty past. Yeah, that was our um start time. Is that okay? Great. So thank you so much for listening, everybody. <laughs>
I am just going to now uh, share your screen. Now I've got two on here. Let's have a look. We need this one. Okay, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. We're delighted to be here. And um, we're going to be talking to you about ESO ecological literacy. And as Miranda says, wonderful synergies um, um, to all the other presentations that have come before us and likely coming after also. Amazing to be here. Thank you very much. I've learned so much over the last 24 hours, and I was just saying to Miranda how those things are really coming together. But having worked in this field for a time, uh, actually, when you listen to other people talking, you think, well, I didn't know that that was going on or this was going on. And actually, I think it's in the collective thinking uh, that we will be able to make differences. Uh, at the moment, it feels as if there may be uh, little pockets of resistance and pockets of change, which gradually will become a, an entire scene. And so we put the abstract up on, on the board, not to read it out because it's already in your printed notes, but just to bring together some of the words that we'll be using as important guides uh, to our thinking. So we agree totally that the earth crisis is the way to talk about it. People talk about all sorts of other things. When thinking comes together, you start to use the same terminology and people begin to understand what that means. So certainly the earth crisis is important. Uh, for certainly a lot of our writing, my writing, we also refer to uh, Morton's work of hyper objects, those things that are incredibly difficult to grasp. You, in the past, you think you have a problem, you can go at it in a linear sort of way, set targets, you've solved that bit, you move on to the next bit. But what we know about the Earth crisis is that it's many layered, it's linked up all over the place. And as I say, it's what Morton would call a hyper object. You can never quite grasp it, but you know you're stuck to it. And you know that every action you make actually contributes to it even if you don't want it to. And so I guess what we're saying is it's a, a sense of heightened awareness of how the contributions collectively and individually add to the problem or alleviate the problem. Uh, and so wicked objects, hyper objects, and that idea of it all being linked is that sense of entanglement. And we tend to, in the past, I guess, think as individuals, act as as individuals, but don't realize again that every movement has a counter movement, every involvement has a counter involvement, and we need to raise the awareness, even if we're not doing anything at that time, of how these things are uh, working together. So, <laughs> oh, sorry. I, I will just tell you, it's, it's interesting working with two people. She said, if you talk too long, I'll just move the screen. <laughs> And she'd just done it. I was just warming up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, this slide here, that's me and Chris as ladybirds. We work really well together. And um, we both come from different backgrounds. So we thought we'd like to talk to you a little bit about who we are and why this is interesting and important to us. So I said to Chris that I would start. So um, my name is Emisha. I'm a senior lecturer in art education at the University of Exeter. I used to um, be a primary teacher with a specialism in early years. I identify as an artist, teacher, researcher. I'm very heavily involved in the NSEAD, that's the National Society for Education and Art and Design. And I've um, started to develop a new special interest group that is Art Education for the Environment and Climate Emergency. So increasingly, my passion for both art and the environment is coming together and I'm really so motivated to make a difference. I also identify as a degrowther. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with the degrowth movement, which is <laughs> absolutely the opposite of what our government is doing. And even, if <laughs> and even if there's a change of government, chances are they're not going to be supporting the degrowth agenda. But um, Bridget talked about 
overshoot. And the idea of overshoot is absolutely essential to understanding the importance of degrowth. And in, in a nutshell, although it's immensely complex and very political and economic, um, degrowth is recognizing that in the global north, our consumption, our behaviors, our attitudes need to change if we're going to make a real difference in the global south. So we, we can't carry on doing what we're doing. We can't tinker around and say technology is going to save us because it isn't. Um, end of degrowth rant <laughs> for the moment, but it's just so exciting to be working in such an important area and particularly to think you can make a difference in the lives of young people. Because although it's important to all of us, young people and children are our future. So education, in the words of Nelson Mandela, is the most powerful weapon to change the world. So what a privilege to work in education and feel you can make a difference. So now I hand over to Chris. And I share Emisha's passion. That's what brings us together. And we come from sort of opposite ends of the spectrum traditionally in a curriculum sense. But my career, as you see from the lines on my face and my age, has been long and I hope fruitful and has a long way to go yet in terms of making a contribution. But it's a little bit like a sandwich in that I started life as a behavioural ecologist. I studied mice in a small room on the seventh floor of a university in London and began to think this is the wrong thing to be doing. I'm now abandoning all the other stimuli that come into this mouse in order to measure one thing. And so really throughout my career, I've begun to realize I've got to change that. So as a sandwich, I started as a behavioral ecologist and did research. I then went into teaching and then I got so passionate about education and the way it might change things uh, that I progressed through the ladder. I was uh, a principal of a community college in Devon then I was an executive principal of a series of schools. And gradually, as I got more influential, became more and more disillusioned that I was actually acting as a functionary of government, doing what they wanted me to do, but without actually being able to make the changes that I thought were important. So at the end of that period of time, I then went into university work, did a doctorate at Exeter under the guidance of two people. One was one called Deborah Osberg, who you may have heard of in terms of post-humanism, and Emma Schutt was my second supervisor. And that's during that period of time of research, which started about 12 years ago, um, then we came up with the theory, or well, I came up with the theory supported by Emma Schutt of ESO ecology, and we'll, we'll see why uh, a, a little bit later. She can't change the slide now so uh, <laughs> but anyway that that's my sort of background and we've been working closely together uh, and working in a research team in order to further the thinking um yeah i mean this is just a very, very powerful picture and i was saying to emisha last night whilst we're going through these that uh this is not dissimilar to the very powerful picture that happened uh, or, or was displayed during the vietnam war where there was a naked girl running across a bridge uh, with bombs going off behind her. And actually, amazingly, some years later, I met her at a conference and she talked about that very experience. But here we have a powerful scene um, that we used to think that environment problems were just about the climate, were just about changes in climate and so on. Now we realize how it intersects with all other social issues uh, and problems, uh, and now we, we recognise it very much as cultural and spiritual transformational work. So just thinking a little bit about popular culture, and um, the picture on the left, if you grew up in the 80s like me, that's um, Button Moon, back in the good old days. <laughs> And now, they um, recognize it, <laughs> great. yeah, button moon, very simple, very simple. And then over here on the right, we have Ryan's World. And I'd be surprised if you haven't heard of Ryan's World, but Ryan's World is everything that's wrong with the world. To be honest. Blatant consumerism and glorification of stuff. So not only does the, you know, Ryan's World on YouTube, it's constantly him having stuff and playing playing with stuff and going on adventures and all this kind of thing. But also he has his own line of products. And we're sharing this with children. And people are saying, you know, this is 21st century culture. 
we need to stop and think there's a perversity to this because this is not about saving the planet this is not about addressing the earth crisis it's the very opposite so my son who's five and a half he gets to watch ryan's world for a very short period as a little treat but it makes me feel really uncomfortable and that's <laughs> that's a very unpopular kind of a way of looking at it but it's thinking in that kind of critical headspace um and here's a picture here of some climate activists in Australia. It says here, surfers paddle out in peaceful protest of international oil companies' plans to drill off the coast of mainland Australia, a region known as the Great Australian Bight. So here we are, they're protesting, that's all very positive, they're taking action, we don't want new oil activity happening, but ironically, what was used to make their surfboards and their paddles? Plastic. How do we make plastic? Oil. So this is not black and white. We can't say no more plastics in the world. It's not that simple. And that's why we need people who really care thinking and asking difficult questions and problematizing and challenging because there is no simple solution. There is no one way of addressing these problems. But we have to constantly stop and think, you know, what's going on here? Who says this? Who says that? What do I think? So it's 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 really complex and, and fascinating. Um, there's been a lot of mention already about ecological anxiety, not just amongst children and young people, but everyone. And why is that? We've also have presenters saying, you know, it's not about, of course, recognizing ecological anxiety, but also, yes, we have to address the symptoms, but what's causing that? We need to come back to the cause. Um, and this um, graph here is generated by a relatively new tool that is from Google Books. I don't know if you come across it. It's quite good to play around with. Not especially, you know, perfect for research, but it gives you an indication in Google Books references. You can put any terms in, any kind of language, any date range, and it generates data to show you trends in references. It just within Google Books. So it, 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 it gives you something to can kind of reflect upon. But we can see there's a clear upward trend here, which is problematic. Um, so we absolutely have to be aware that ecological anxiety exists, but coming back to the, the root cause of that. Um, and then here we are with bringing about the arts. <laughs> Here's a painting. Um, I just stumbled across this one on a Facebook group about 20th century modern art. And one of the group members commented, here's little Greta, I bet she wished she'd gone to school now. And that in opened up some interest, because it looks a little bit like Greta Thunberg. It isn't her, obviously, it was, it was painted in 1886. But the conversations that followed about climate change as ecological, ecological damage, young people, Greta's mission, were really fascinating, because it gives you insights into people's opinions and perspectives on the piece and this idea of lost is so important in terms of children and young people because what a difficult time to be alive it's so very very hard to be a young person even if you're five and a half there's so much going on around you not just in the media but you know conversations and things you can see and things you can feel that are really difficult to to deal with so we have such a responsibility as adults and educators to make a real difference in that respect I'm also talking to this one. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So um, we're thinking about transformation. We're thinking about curriculum. So we have the curriculum in kind of three different dimensions here. Firstly, there's the explicit set content, content, which could come from policy or it could be something that's generated in school or other educational setting. Um, and then we have the values, which are implicit in that curriculum, but also if you're the educator, how you translate the curriculum, how you interact with your students, what you say and what you don't say. And then in, in addition, we have the extra curricular activities, what's on offer and how does it relate? How does it address perhaps some of the gaps in the set curriculum? And lots of people are arguing and saying, it's not enough to add in um, extracurricular activities to address the earth crisis it should be right there in the center of everything that's happening not just in geography and not just in science but across the board um, and a really interesting report i can re recommend to you published in 2022 um agawal et al it's 
published in collaboration with the Stockholm Environment Institute's very long um, document full of very interesting data and um, kind of recommendations. They talk about a youth vision and they define youth as 18 to 30 year olds. So it's you know, after compulsory schooling, but it, you, you hear you know, people's opinions patterns and trends that are worth being aware and this is I forget how many countries but it's a, gl a global study lots of data from lots of different contexts from both the global north and the global south and they have some recommendations there that we need climate education happening and it has to have that civic engagement component to be worthwhile there should be training for educators so they can deliver that um, in, um, teaching and also structures in place so some countries don't even have schools where students can come together to start learning about how to make a difference and then innovation and educational approaches so I don't think any of us would disagree with those points but in our presentation we're going to go a little bit deeper into more than the kind of infrastructure that's recommended here thank you do you want to change places no, you, you, use, you use your left hand okay <laughs> um yeah, so uh, the, the bit that I, I didn't mention was that I'd moved from sort of uh, a behavioral ecologist to educator. And now I guess I moved right into philosophy and uh, particularly eco philosophy or educational philosophy. And uh, as you will know, philosophers all the time start to try and understand exactly what words mean. I'm hypersensitive to when people use words. I always want to say, yeah, but what do you exactly mean by that? Because someone else used it and they were using it in a different way. Uh, and things like nature, uh, things like ecology, everything that has eco in front of it, I'm deeply suspicious because it's been taken up uh, by big industry. They think that if they put eco soap or eco this, that people will buy it because in some way it's contributing to the crises we've got. That's not the case. So actually what we're saying is radical change is required in terminology, in belief systems, in understanding. We as people have got to change. And so something out of uh, uh, some writing I did says that curricula are inspired by entangling the conventional strands of learning, a pedagogy that recognizes the complexity of knowledge formation, a philosophy that understands the implications of an unknown and risky future. We're into the realms of futures thinking, which is time-based and uh, another whole area. And a care, a care meaning that we're into ethical spaces uh, that don't rely upon what's happened before, but ha uh, rely upon what we really believe might happen in the future. And we need to be careful about that ethical space. So an unknown and risky future and a care that fosters enchantment. And I guess you could use the word wonder, which uh, is an interesting one, and fragility of the world. We've always thought the world was quite robust. We always thought the politics would save us. We always think that the planet will not change. But now we know we're into this risky, uh, tentative, volatile area where we don't know quite what will happen. And that's the difficult thing. So fragility of all the world, uh, of the world and all within it. And I claim, Emersher claims, and I hope three or four other people might claim that ecology supports these dimensions of dynamic change. Yes, what places? <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll unpack fact what we mean by ecology ecology because that is obviously, obviously essential to your understanding so um we're coming back to this notion of definition which of course is absolutely essential to all conceptual understanding um here are some popular terms which i'm sure you're familiar with which are used in lots of different contexts and put together in some groups so we've got sustainable and there, there is there is actually a book called sustainability if it's everything is it nothing and you know it's one of those terms sustainability what do you mean it's so context um dependent green sometimes that's good sometimes that's bad chris has already spoken about eco planet friendly um and then we have climate change and personally i'm saying this because yesterday i really disliked that term bridget said a little bit about that you know climate action is one of unesco's 17 global goals it's one 
And there are six environmental goals that are to do with energy, they're to do with consumption and production, it's to do with life on land, it's to do with water and sanitation, it's to do with life underwater, and they're all interconnected. It isn't just about the climate. No, the climate is often a catchy catch-all. It distances many people from their kind of ownership, their engagement. It's like, I can't touch it, I can't really see it. Um, what does that really mean? Um, we got the climate emergency and crisis, which is kind of stressing that, yes, there is an urgency here. Global warming, which is an impact of ecological destruction and exploitation. Um, and then I've put in bold earth crisis because that's the, the, in the title of this conference. And it's, it's just a really lovely term that I think encompasses everything we care about here. And then if we think about some more terminology, sometimes people say, you know, animals and plants, that's non-human. I think that's negative because it's saying human, but you're not a human. Other than human, beyond human, there's a slight positivity there, but the term Chris and I like, and I heard him right in saying this, the more than human, because in, in terms of number, certainly, <laughs> the more than human world outnumbers humans. But also I think, we just don't get it. There's so much we do not understand. We don't even know exists in the world. You just think about, you know, the horrors of deep sea mining in these areas where uh, every day they're discovering new species. But because we can't see it, people are like, yeah, but we need all these minerals and precious metals and we can recover and no one can see it anyway. But yes. OK, so essentially the terminology around all of these matters uh, is a little bit like diving into a black hole. Once you start digging, <laughs> you see just how complicated it is. And if you want to get philosophical as well, it also adds another layer of complexity. And there's some really interesting research work going on at the University of Gloucester around eco-linguistics. And they do have a free online program where you can engage in some of their research and thinking around eco-linguistics, which is quite an emergent area, but it's so essential to how we make sense of these problems and then how we can go about dealing with them. Chris. Yeah, thank you. Uh, should I stop places? Um, yes, and just, just following up, up from what Emma just said, um, I'm really proud of the fact that I was invited to become an associate fellow at UCL in their research group, which deals with these things. But the first question I had to ask was the terminology of the research group, uh, because it's climate change and sustainability education. So I said, what do you mean by climate change and what do you mean by sustainability education? So I made myself quite unpopular to begin with, and I note that the name is still there. So I haven't made that much of an influence there, but at least we start to think about uh, those sorts of things. So what's in a name? Well, I have a, a, a real problem every time I hear the word nature, because during the period of COVID, I heard people saying things like, let's return to nature. And I don't know what that means, because as far as I'm concerned, particularly as a biologist, I am nature. This is nature. Emmershire is nature. Standing here is nature. So how do we go back to nature. Does it mean going out of this room and into that area? Is that nature out there? Because it's got, and, and I'm not criticizing any of those things. I'm just saying that if we use terminology, we need to be clear about it. So nature has come through in terms of restoring and protecting nature. Actually, nature is very capable of restoring itself and protecting itself. That's what nature does. So why do we capitalise on that and pretend that we're still in control by now saying we've done things wrong, we'll now restore and protect it? Falling in love with nature. I've never fallen out of love with nature, but it's actually quite interesting uh, that people, that this is, whole thing is wrapped up in aesthetics because we see particular pictures and we think they're beautiful. Uh, and therefore we warm to them. But if we see a power station, we say, well, it's useful, but it's not very beautiful. But is it nature? And we'll come back to that. Nature recovery, again, it's capable of recovering itself. We don't need to do much to allow it to recover, except stand back from it and stop interfering. So, and I've said about return to nature. Thank you. So, I mean, I just came up with these two examples, really, of the one on the left, I'm not going to say anything more about it, or the one on the right. We'll come back to it, but I'll give you 30 seconds just to look at those. 
Um, which of these are related to nature? Which of these are eco-ecological? You might be able to answer the first. You'll say to me, I can't answer the second until you tell me what eco-ecology is, or even in Miranda's case, how to pronounce it. But uh, uh, eco-ecology, uh, which of these are eco-ecological? We'll come back to that. So um, I've been recently using um, some free AI tools in interviews to kind of elicit um, people's feelings and experiences because quite easy to pop some words in and generate some images. So I did that with some of our key terminology. This is using a program called Crayon. It's free. Um, it's online. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to pay any money. But if you want to include animals and people, just don't do it for bedtime. It's a nightmare. Some of the creations there. So ecology it generated these images. This is not what we mean when we say ecology. Aesthetics, this is absolutely not what we mean when we say aesthetics. Easter ecology, as you can see the creepy people. No, 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 this is not what we mean when we say Easter ecology. And Easter ecological literacy, again, oh dear me, no, no, no. But I would say in its favour, AI really does open up opportunities for critique. So in that, res in that respect, it's, it's, it's positive. So here we are, we get to the, the heart of it. What is, what the heck is ESO ecology? I don't know. <laughs> okay, we, we get uh, philosophical here. Uh, ESO ecology is an ethico onto epistemological theory. So let's just uh, unpick that. Ethico, you can guess at, that's uh, something which has to do with ethics. It has to do with carefulness, caring, thinking about others, empathizing, all of those things are important aspects. Onto obviously comes from ontology, and ontology is the way we feel about the world, the way we, we uh, adopt the world, the, the, the planet, the global situation. So onto, ontology is the way we are, and epistemology is, of course, the way we learn. So each of those are wrapped up in the theory of ecology. And it seemed to me, coming from an educational uh, uh, period of uh, time in my career, that each one of those are absolutely essential when we are talking about uh, education itself. So it fuses a theory of being, the onto, with a theory of knowledge and has a strong ethical dimension to it. And it underpins an education that values both affectivity and connectedness. Uh, you would all have a different way of defining aesthetics in different contexts. It might be beauty. In my case, what we talk about is the idea that it's to do with the senses. It's to do with the way we perceive the world. It's to do with the way in which we feel our emotions and therefore our behaviours according to that empathy with everything around us, not just other people, all organisms and all uh, that exists uh, as well in terms of materials. And it values affectivity. But my contention is that I recognise biologically I'm sensing things all the time. I'm looking around, you're looking around, everyone looks around. They take in through their senses and perhaps even other means what it is to be alive, what it is to be in a particular context, what it is to be in a particular place. But actually, that's no good for me if I don't discuss that with other people, if I don't go into dialogue, not just with other people, but with other things around me. And that's what we mean by connectedness. So affectivity and connectedness is the ESO ecology. The ecology is the connectivity. The ESO is a sense of what it is to be. And therefore, it underpins those values. Uh, it, it concerns the way we perceive and sense the world and all within it in microcosm and a macrocosm. And it also is to do with how we feel inside, what's going on inside us, as well as what's going on outside us, and actually pulling those two together so that there's some synergy between what's happening inside us and what's happening outside us, 
uh, and a microcosm and macrocosm, what's happening here in detail and what's happening in a much more global sense. So how do we do that pogo sticking from down on the ground to up here and having some sort of complete idea of what's going on? It's quite a difficult skill to have, to focus and also to see the big picture. So connectedness, how we per share our perceptions with others, because actually what I might perceive may be completely wrong. But until I talk to Emma Sher and she says, well, yes, I perceive it like that, but actually I might perceive it like that. I begin to change my ideas of, of what it is we're both perceiving. And as you grow that, so uh, the terminology changes, our understanding changes, uh, and there's a deepening uh, to that whole situation. So it's a component of education. It's important. Feelings, emotions, sensitivities, awareness and perception are central to what we're about. And actually, I would argue, central to what all other organisms are about to a greater or lesser degree. And we mustn't see them as lesser. There are some organisms that perceive the world much more acutely than we can, but we just don't know that. What is it, what is it to be a bat, uh, for example? We have no idea but you actually can extend that. So what is it to be Emersher? I have no idea really what it is to be Emersher, except what she's willing to tell me or show me. There might be all sorts of other things going on underneath uh, and equally with, with everyone here. We talk about things, we try to understand things, but no one knows what it's like to be me. Actually, I think I don't know quite what it's like to be me and I've lived on this planet a very long time. I'm still struggling with it. Uh, but if you see what I mean in terms of that, and I maintain that elements of education have been sidelined or marginalized in a neoliberal atmosphere of measurement, judgment, and linearity. And when I say I was turned off education, that's what turned me off education to a great degree. Mm -hmm. And connected to that, you may have come across some of them, this artist's work. Um, so he's made a whole series of in instruments which are ridiculous in terms of their practicality because they're measuring devices that clearly aren't going to measure much at all so this notion and we talk about the value of in the arts about qualities recognizing qualities generating qualities and you can't quantify them and why should you quantify them and then there's a whole kind of raft of um conversation in, in you know quantifying nature and putting a price on it and saying well because it's worth this many dollars we'll save it and that's an, another kind of area of contention. So Rick Salafia's um, instruments, I forget how many he's got, something like 200 different weird and wonderful um, pieces that he's created. But yes, yeah, some things we can't measure and actually, why should we? Certainly in terms of numbers. Um, and Chris, I think you were gonna talk to us. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to that. Um, and so generally we've lived in a world which is very anthrocentric. Uh, Actually, we've looked and cared for each other generally, not always, but generally we look out for ourselves. We look out for what's best for us as a species, because that's quite a natural thing to do, actually, to want the species to survive. So we've looked out for ourselves, but we do it at huge expense. So the argument is that we move from a, an anthropocentric situation to one which begins to be more post-humanistic, uh, more uh, neo-materialist uh, and adopt a complete change of mindset in order to go forward. And I think our belief is until we, the next generation, have a changed mindset, we're not going to be dealing with the hyper objects uh, and the wicked problems that we're now faced with. So it's not a matter of putting this in the curriculum or that in the curriculum. I noticed that Ofsted said that only climate change can be taught through science and geography. And if they see it anywhere else, it's too political. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if we look at that as a way in which the state uh, can be controlling, mm -hmm. uh, then my argument is that we can only look at these mindset changes through massive radical changes in schools and curriculum. Um, and so affectivity is an appreciation and awareness of affectivity are characteristics. And I've talked about nurturing uh, those characteristics, but the awareness is not merely egocentric. It's not just about me. It's not just those feelings that I have, uh, but we need to move forward to something that becomes ecocentric, an ecocentric development.
Um, and this is uh, ecocentric affectivity is an understanding and nurturing uh, in significant ways that decenters the human. Uh, and that's difficult because you, we keep jumping back into the center as individuals and groups. That's why it's so difficult to solve the problems. That's why it's very much an ethical problem that sticks to us that we always have to try and change. It's not to say that the human doesn't matter, but as a species, we need to begin to value and appreciate the more than human. Uh, and this is in the best interest of a planet, which actually our survival depends upon, and yet we've ignored that for far too long. So we can't marginalize our ecological context and the aesthetics of our existence alongside these ecological contexts are so valuable that in the research, we began to see aesthetics and ecology not as separate things in the way that I've described them, but actually being absolutely symbiotic. They can't, in our definition, exist on their own if we take effectivity and connectivity. It's got to be one word. And so it became estoecology as a way of feeling, a way of doing, a way of communicating, and a way of changing mindsets. No. Yeah. yeah, good. So we go to isto ecocentricity, playing with words, playing with linguistics, but they're important. They're not just words. So we exist in a world which has marginalized those and that, which arguably have comparable rights to ours. We've seen an existential growth in equality, in inequality, not just between our species and other species and the mineral world, as it were, the material world, but also between each other. There's never been a bigger gap between those that have and those that don't. There's never been a greater disparity between the way in which some people live and other people live, uh, both within countries and between countries and between regions of the globe. And that's why it makes it a massive, wicked problem, because we're not just dealing with a change in the climate, which is self-induced, but we're dealing with something much more than that, which will arise from it. So it's. Um, so, yeah, and it's unsustainable, even in the short term, we're there, we're not going to have it, it's not in the future, we're living with it now, uh, and we will live with it for a long time, whatever we do. And we must understand what's led to these situations arising, address the causes, and move from anthropocentricity to isto ecocentricity. Yours. Oh, yeah, and we've seen this already. Yeah, you've, you've done this being pinched from us. <laughs> but obviously. <laughs> slightly different, slightly different, but nice. It's, it's the same idea, isn't it? It's that, that sense of perception, that sense of interpretation. Is the deer crossing the road or is the road crossing the forest? And something similar, you know, if there's a, a, a fly or a wasp in your living room, maybe your, your house is in the wrong place. <laughs> so, you know, just thinking about these issues is, is really important. But it comes back to that kind of, um, that Chris was talking about, you know, the, the sense of being, that's the, the ontology, how you perceive the world is, is so important. So, um, Chris, I think you were going to briefly talk about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I will just say about the deer, if I may, um, that I live part of the time in the New Forest, uh, and that's been adopted by the New Forest Green Party as being a very important part of their philosophy. Uh, and when I see people driving through the New Forest at, in a 40 mile an hour zone, which is far too great, at 60 miles an hour, because they're trying to get somewhere, and deer and horses and cattle, if they get in the way, uh, then that's just bad luck. It's bad luck for the driver as well, because if you've ever hit a cow, uh, you'd know about it, but, but nevertheless. So literacy, the, the use of words as we're playing around with them at the moment, involves a continuum of learning in enabling individuals to achieve their goals, their knowledge and potential, and to participate fully in the community and wider society as UNESCO says. Mm -hmm. So this definition by UNESCO, UNESCO is very different to the sort of definition of text-based literacy that you're likely to find in, you know, standard schooling practice. It's, it's, it's about enabling, it's about empowering, it's about emancipation. 
here are some more terms with which you may, you may well be familiar. We've heard some of them from other presenters. There's a whole raft of literature and um, philosophizing on, on these different areas and they're interrelated, but they're all distinct. Some of these you may be familiar with or not. So um, climate literacy is one particular kind of area of interest and in research. But again, it focuses exclusively on climate. <laughs> and we've already talked about how climate is one component of the larger ecological um, um, sort of raft of issues. Um, and there's an example. These are some recent publications linked to each of those um, areas, each of those terms. And then carbon literacy is a very kind of specialist area. And there's an organisation in, based in the UK called the Carbon Literacy Project, and they create packages of training resources that organisations can buy. And then their staff members or students can be certificates have a certificate <laughs> for being carbon literate so they can understand what car you know what carbon is and uh, how it's used and the, the the issues all around that but it's very very specific just to carbon it's absolutely in a tiny little area and then we have environmental literacy which is probably the broadest of them all because if we think about environment it isn't just about the natural world but it's anything within the environment um and there's a, an example of a, a, a recent article. And then we have ecological literacy, which is a little more specialised. It has a stronger kind of biological focus in a lot of the writing. And there's a book there that I recently discovered and I haven't yet bought, but I'm going to, Mediating Nature, the Role of Technology in Ecological Literacy. And when it says technology there, it also means like digital media, so like film and TV and images and so it's it's very relevant if you're an art educator and you're interested in popular culture and how we communicate in a positive way or how we're miscommunicated to by those who want to sell us stuff we do not need and actually contributing to the earth crisis. And then there's also a term called eco-literacy, which interestingly is sometimes a shortening of ecological literacy. It's not quite the same thing. It actually has a spiritual dimension. And this example here, using picture books to enhance eco-literacy of first grade students is actually a kind of misuse of the term because sometimes it's condensed like that because it's a bit more catchy and maybe child friendly. The proper understanding of eco literacy is a lot more complex. It's not a very, it is a variation on ecological literacy, but it has that kind of spiritual existential dimension to it. But it's another area that you, you might like to look into. There's actually an excellent article that we were looking at that was published, I don't know how many years ago, in 2017 or something, mm -hmm. but essentially it distills all these different frameworks and definitions, and it's immensely complex to get your head around but also useful so if anyone wants me to signpost you to that you're more than welcome to get in touch um what's quite common with all these different kind of approaches to literacy is this kind of notion of framework and this notion of progress um here's one example from the Hoopenen study um where there's this idea that you move from a nominal literacy which is kind of the uh, emergent stage onto functional literacy, where you can have some use, to operational literacy, where there's a sense of fluency. So this is one of probably a thousand <laughs> different models, and it, it's useful. There's you know, that notion of progress, which of course we know in statutory curriculum is kind of up there as one of the kind of key, um, key targets for, for learning, but it's not what ESO ecological literacy is about. So I haven't thrown a spanner in the work because that's, I think it's still useful to be aware of, but it's not exactly what we're talking about. I'll hand it over to Chris. Okay, so literacy comes in many forms. It's clearly not just reading and writing. The idea of literacy is uh, an individual com component of the curriculum, but I'd rather see it as, again, drawing on Timothy Morton, uh, uh, the idea of a mesh that actually everything is so interconnected that it's actually quite difficult to pin things down. So a mesh that binds everything else together, a vertical and horizontal component throughout all the ages and phases of education, including lifelong learning. So what we're saying is that actually, if you are going to understand ecology as terminology for addressing some of these problems, it has to be enmeshed 
with everything that we do in education, a change in approach, a change in the way we uh, are, are within the world and a change to the knowledge base of that as well. So um, that's the way we're looking at literacy in terms of East Ecology. Um, peas. Oh, yeah, peas they're peas. Um, you may be familiar <laughs> with um, Lev Vygotsky, the um, um, famous Russian psychologist who's very popular in terms of social cultural theory his notion of the zone of proximal development. And there's a lovely quote he has in regard to children. And he says, concepts are not in children's brains rolling around like peas. So not, you don't have children's heads, our heads are full of little tiny peas rolling around at all. And that's a really nice idea. You don't just pop in, a, uh, you have a letter and pop another pea in your brain. It's much, much more um, complex and richer than that idea. And this is just a sort of diagram of when I talk about a mesh, um, this idea that you have nodes collect, connected all over the place. Um, now, I have a particular interest in uh, consciousness, uh, the, the, the big question, what is consciousness? And is consciousness something that's out there in the cosmos? Is it connected to us in that sort of way? Is it just in our neuronal systems? And I have my own views, but uh, Emma sure will stop me if I start going into them. Uh, but in a sense, this is how I see it. I talked about micro level and macro level. I see this as a neurological model, how it might be within our nervous system. I see this as a small society connecting all of the nodes within it. And I see it in a cosmological sense uh, that what happens a very long way away from us actually also has an influence and we have an influence on that. So a change in mindset is a change in both cosmology and neurology and uh, community in all sorts of uh, uh, settings. So that gives an illustration of that thinking. Um, and the mesh, according to Morton, uh, each point of the mesh is both the center and the edge of a system of points. He problematizes this theory from the standpoint of ecological entanglement and the uh, proposes that ecological criticism must remove the division between nature and culture. And that brings me back to nature, uh, the whole idea that we have separate things, but actually things interact, uh, moving away from uh, Cartesian dualism uh, to much more collective sense of how we understand the world. The challenge that nature exists as something that supports and nourishes civilization, but is outside of society. And the more we can bring it into ourselves, into everything, and move away from the idea that we've got to save nature, which is out there, because we can do what we like here, we can carry on in our own way, but as long as we preserve something out there that we can go into and have a look at, then we're saving the planet wrong as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, so we need to develop a narrative and that has been a theme that has come through in everyone's presentation. We're talking about this, we're sharing it with each other, we're um, wanting to make sense and help others to make sense. Um, and there's a recent, well, fairly recent publication here by um, an American author who's actually uh, an expert in politics but has a really deep interest in art and she writes in this publication about the relationship between art and politics. And it's a really excellent book. I can really recommend it to you. I can give you the title. I haven't put it on there. Um, but Shaloining, it's not an easy name to say, she talks about the importance of story and art can create stories and we can create stories from art. And that's how we as humans certainly make sense of the world through story, whether that's oral or written, or visual story making is immensely powerful. And she says here, the uncertainty about the global warming changes underway calls for a story that will bring the fragments together, the peas, think about peas, in a meaningful way to move beyond paralysis, that fear of this is all too scary. What can I do as one little person? Well, actually you can do an awful lot. You absolutely can, because you're going to act with others and share with others and, and build that momentum. Stories will help us frame reality by condensing the complexity of the Anthropocene, 
focus on humans and recognizing, you know, now geologically there's, you know, evidence of human life in a really negative way on the very earth we're walking on into meaningful messages. So that, that, that quotation there is just really emphasizing the importance of story. How do we create story? Well, certainly language is absolutely key, whether that's written or spoken or whether we're interpreting that into artworks. Um, and language, as Wittgenstein would argue, and I'm sure you'd all make sense of, language shapes our perception. So the languages we can speak, the languages we understand, the words we use, the words we are familiar with, we're confident with, help us make sense of the world, help us make the world. So if you can read music, you can read this piece of Mozart and play it maybe. If you can't, you might say, well, yeah, it's got some lines and some dots and that kind of thing, but it gives that access. And that's so important to conceptual understanding. And it's so important to communication. It's absolutely essential. So final thoughts how are we for time Miranda because I know we started a little late 10 minutes okay so Chris okay so 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 we're, we're we're back to this uh little conundrum if it is a conundrum um because it it spoke to me when I saw both of these pictures uh, again we come back to the idea of what's nature but what's ecological in the terms that uh, we've used them the one on the left uh I, I don't know I mean what does that feel like for you tell me some emotions that you have around the one on the left anyone maybe you have none cozy okay home protective exposed okay yeah so and and would would that elicit a response of oh or or any other critical sense I guess with most people, they'd say, oh, that's nice. That's a nature. That's nice. Eggs and a you know, little nest. The little birds made the nest and it's there. And then when the bird leaves the nest, it'll all actually go back into the ground and that would be great. And the one on the right elicits for me a, a lack of feel for the natural world. Uh, in all ways, that for me suggests concrete, which is bad in itself, but also water runs off it rather than going into the soil. Does it, well, how does it make you feel? You might think that's my dream home. <laughs> but, uh, that is my home. <laughs> yeah, 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 thank you. Any other feelings? Clean, yes, clean, sanitized, uh, humanized. Let's not, I can't see, apart from a couple of palm trees, probably in an area of the world where palm trees don't normally grow, uh, planted in the front as some sort of tokenism to what it is to be in nature. We'll have something natural so we can see it out of the window. And, you know, we live in that sanitized sort of world which we don't really believe is beautiful, but nature on the other side it's beautiful. Uh, and I think it's just worth thinking through those uh, comparisons. But they are both related to nature, even yeah. though you may think one is natural because it's made by some birds, and then humans made this with some concrete and metal and paint and stuff. But they are absolutely both related to nature. They both have an impact on nature. They both have a place in nature. And they are both so ecological. And I just want to add something if I've got time. Please. I'm not sure if you yeah, I, well, I have. I have. Um, uh, we come from Devon, so we're quite used for, to rural areas. And if a car comes past every hour, we think it's you know getting it's in our fun. way, really. Uh, so, and then of course, I love London and walking walking on the streets. If I haven't been to London for a while, walking on the streets, and I suddenly realise uh, that this is a completely different environment, but massively, massively affected. Uh, by uh, all of our actions, but we put up with it. Uh, and uh, and it's the same with buildings and so on, but yeah, they're both natural. Okay. So we propose that we can transform education and in so doing our relationship with the planet. The two are symbiotic and have to be. The transformation is essential not to stop the earth crisis, but to assist the next generation in dealing 
with the myriad of effects of global warming. And this is not something that lies within the remit of any one subject area, but uh, I argue strongly that it's multidimensional and transdisciplinary. transdisciplinary. And so transdisciplinarity uh, it appears implicit in art and design. It draws attention to strong interconnections, which make art and design important in a transdisciplinary sense, penetrating and amplifying understandings and knowledge construction in the other subject areas. So there's something about art and design which is so strong. And, and as a scientist, you might be surprised I argue this, but from a, 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 a curriculum sense, it, I believe, should not be peripheral. It actually has a position being absolutely central and influencing everything else. And I have to take issue, for example, and I know it's been mentioned, but the idea of STEAM is actually still saying it's science, technology, art, uh, uh, and so on. Whereas actually, if you do that, you're maintaining those disciplines. Some would argue that that's important, but I would argue for much more inter, intra, uh, cross-disciplinarity. So there are features of this. Eco ecological foundations are to do with creativity, criticality, ecocentricity, not egocentricity, ecocentricity, affective relationality, as we defined it, and ecological connectivity. The educational implications then are transdisciplinarity, post-humanism and a new materialist approach, elimination of dualism between body and mind, and dialogic relationality. And here's a lovely quotation for you and a lovely image. Um, environmental sustainability is one priority for education, and this cannot be separated from other societal challenges, including racism, unemployment, and health and well-being. We do not see these as in competition, but as a constellation of priorities which demand our urgent and collective attention. So all of those things are out there. They're all interrelated and they are all important. And uh, another term which, which is implicit in our work is liminality. Uh, uh, a liminality is spaces for change, creating spaces within which we can change our perception of what we're doing, where we're going, and how we're being, uh, so that a world that is occupied is furnished with already existing things, but one that's inhabited is woven from the strands of their continual coming into being. And that's a very strong sense of, if you don't know uh, uh, Tim Ingold, he writes very powerfully on this whole idea of interconnectivity. Mm -hmm and coming into being as emergence yeah. and world making. Um, and this is our final slide. Um, and it was lovely to see Kirsten's presentation yesterday with the roots, because yeah. we also have the roots here in this image on the left. And this quote, quote from Thoreau, there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who's striking at the root. And it comes back to what is, what's the problem here? What are the problems? What are the issues? How can we address the root of all of this and that is absolutely essential and our argument is that eso ecology as an ethico on onto epistemology because it's about being in the world and thinking really deeply it is it does have the potential to be transformative it is absolutely not an add-on it is almost like a sort of existential choice yes Yes. Um, and then we have a, a little image there, Greta Thunberg, and a quote where she says, the one thing we need more than hope is action. And once we start to act, hope is everywhere. And actually thinking is an action. Talking to yourself, reflecting by yourself is an action. And then you can build on that and have conversations with people and start to make a real difference. And just seeing that, I was doing some other writing last night and I came across eco-anxiety and, and because it was raised yesterday and because it's you know forefront in our mind I, I wrote down a few definitions and and thoughts on eco-anxiety which which I won't give you unless you ask me a question about eco-anxiety then I'll let you have those quotes uh, but uh, I also have to and I'm not congratulate but say to Emisha well done because she's managed to get through the entire talk this this talks to her passion 
because I've seen her talk many times. And, and when she was in supervision of my thesis, she would come in sometimes and I would read her something and she would cry. And I was so tentative about this. I thought I've written something just so <laughs> dreadful. But she's never seen this in a PhD student before. So she was crying about it. But actually she is so hyper emotional about mm -hmm. this stuff that she often can't get through a presentation without. I thought she was on the edge a few I times. Am on the edge right now. And when we were at a conference last week when she was talking, and she said she actually said, Oh God, I'm gonna cry again. I must do something about this. I must have some medication. And the person sitting next to me said, she doesn't need medication. We all need to be responding like that to the crises we're in. That's a great response to it. She doesn't need to be sanitized from it. And I think that was a really important thing uh, that we'd want to get through. I don't know how long we have for questions, if any time. Well, we have we lunch. We should have some questions. Um, uh, our lunch is here, we can see them. So uh, it would be great to open the floor to some questions. I'm going to need to minimize this window yeah, to see if anybody online would also yeah. like to uh, ask a question, but from our <laughs> Bridget. I first want to say I'm so appreciative and it was just ringing bells and resonating and our practice is entirely based on all of that theory and ethics. So thank you for articulating it so well. And um, I have a slight quibble which I hope you'll find interesting, which is to do with the term literacies, mm -hmm. you know, and you're broadening a bit to say it's not really just literacy. Mm -hmm. So I push back and say, let's not even call it mm -hmm. eco-literacy or environmental literacy, let's call it eco-capacities. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, capacities are physical, mm -hmm. um, cultural mm -hmm. and uh, emotional mm -hmm. and so on and so on. Um, and, and so, you know, what, what, when we use the term literacies, we're using it as a kind of metaphor and saying, oh, but actually it's so much broader yeah. than that. And it's the same that happens with the term ecosystem, where it's yeah. taken mm -hmm. and applied to things that are actually not very ecological at all. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's a suggestion in how I, to yeah. take it. I think that that yeah. seems, Mayor? You met. It, I, think that's, <laughs> that, I think that's incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. I think we've used it because it is such a well-known use of a word a bit like nature you know if you tackle people who say nature they say well everyone knows what it is and i say no they don't and i agree with you in terms of that if if i hear you right you're saying that it's actually something which is deeply embedded and and uh, and there and that's why i think uh the whole idea of eso ecology actually combined together actually gives that sense that the eso is about all ways of seeing, hearing, uh, and believing in that message. But equally, to respond to that, we see literacy as the Trojan horse, because in a quality sense, it has such status. And so to use that term is a really good tool for getting in there. And if you want to be radical, if you want to make a difference, you've got to speak the language that talks to the people who, you know, yeah. you're not seeing us either. So we completely appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Similarly, with the term eco, the, the eco thing that yeah. you've described having been, you know, used in green wash, but still it's it's a Trojan horse itself. Yeah, and if you're bidding for money, you have to use yeah, these terms yeah. to tick the boxes, yeah. which is the yeah. very sad thing, isn't it? That's a really, really good question because we can only write from our own perspective and we can appreciate there are other definitions and other understandings, but you've got to be aware they exist and be able to access them to understand them. So we appreciate what we're saying might not make sense to some other people in some other context, but if you'd like to talk about what? aesthetics from your perspective. Yeah, I mean, I'm not an artist. I'm not an aesthetician. 
uh, I come at it from, uh, I guess, from my perspective, uh, a biological perspective of what it is to be aesthetic, what it is to be conscious of the world, uh, and to discriminate between those things that are appealing and not appealing, and allow us to learn, and those things that don't allow. I see it in, in those sorts of terms, seeing the good in things, uh, as opposed to the bad in things. So I, I see it in that way, and I've interpreted it in that way. And when I write about it, I make sure that I interpret it in that way. What Emisha has been, has been a great sounding board uh, because of her arts background about, about how you bring it into other contexts as well. So I, I think we're all in danger of using words which we assume are universal, uh, and yet they're not. And I've come across that uh, with people at philosophy conferences talking about Bildung uh, and assuming that everyone sees it in the same sort of way. And then when I talk to German people, they say, well, no, actually, you know, it's not that at all. But, you know, it's being misinterpreted. But at least as, uh, when you start to use language, it, it starts a dialogue. It allows you to talk about it. And I, I think that, you know, words come and go, ecology might stick around for a bit whilst we're here, uh, but then it might die. But I hope that it, it's been a transition period. It's been a vehicle for moving things on. And that sort of question is the sort of thing that will allow you to interpret it in your, in your way, I think. Okay, I have a question online and they want to take Chris back to the examples of eco-anxiety. Um, oh, can you. you talk about them? Yeah, thank you. I'm pleased to do that. <laughs> Um, and this is from um it's my is, daughter yeah <laughs> emma is that your daughter no, no. no I'm joking, I'm joking. sorry emma <laughs> okay uh no oh she's saying no i'm not his daughter um okay i, I just want to address that because eco anxiety comes up all the time and actually what i what i i think this is embedded in is the whole idea of futures thinking so I'd say it's futures anxiety. It's not just eco-anxiety. The futures anxiety is well beyond the ecological situation. Uh, and I just jotted down a few things. I don't know if you know uh, Damhoff and Gulmans, who say eco-anxiety arises from not only a poverty of imagination, but also a poverty of hope. And they suggest that poverty and hope are intimately connected. Imagining the impossible turns out to become a ne necessity a radical act of hope. Um, and I loved uh, the term that was brought up this morning, I think by you, Bridget, which was positopian. I shall use it and use your name after it. Thank you for that. Um, and, and also futures literacy in terms of UNESCO is the skill to imagine the future in different ways and in different contexts, which might trigger a new sense of agency through perceiving and embracing emergence is something we didn't talk about but it's quite important when it occurs so it's those sorts of things that i think can tackle uh, the eco situation uh, when we imagine more when we explore multiple futures we perceive more in the present and widening the lens of perception so i think that's what certainly the arts do but i hope that educators are, are able to do and i think by just imagining and having hope that they are two mm. things which may well allow people to feel that they can do something about I'd it. I'd also like to respond to that, and I'll get emotional, because um, when we were thinking about the intro, something I didn't talk about was my own ecological stress, anger, sadness, but the fact I'm able to transcend that, and I feel all this anger, which is really immense and powerful, helps me kind of What's the term? I feel like I'm floating and I feel a sense of hope and possibility. And that's, I don't know how to put it into words, clearly, but I feel empowered to do something that I can, I've managed to develop a way of dealing with my immense frustration and anger, at all these terrible things in the world, and feel that I can do something about it. And I literally feel kind of like I'm floating. And I don't, I just might sound a little bit weird, but that is kind of how I feel about it. That is where I can. Make a difference. So I don't know whether that resonates with you, whether you think I'm a little bit crazy, but it's how I feel. I really, all that anger, I'm trying to twist it around and make it positive. And it's um, 
it's not yeah well, I had, I've lost the work, term now it? It, yeah, it's it really hard work it is hard yeah. work yeah I've got a a couple of yeah. comments, not, not so much a question from Dennis mm -hmm. Atkinson, who says in response to what we've been saying, mm -hmm. taking care of, of abstractions is crucial, as inferred. Following on, philosophical thinking begins in wonder, and when it has done its best, the wonder remains. Mm -hmm. So that enchantment mm -hmm. that you were talking about, Thank you, um, uh, which is a Jane Bennett term as well, isn't it? Yeah. The, the enchantment. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that retaining of the positivity and the enchantment whilst expressing the anger. Yeah, the word I yes. was searching for was elated. I feel elated, which seems really the exact opposite of eco-anxiety and <laughs> eco-grief and whatever you want to call it. But I am, I'm actually able to, I don't know whether you can do that, but I can do that. Um, not quite so okay. much. I'm not as imaginative as you. I'm not an um, artist. So uh, um, we have a slight, dis not disagreement, but... I'm more of an animist than Chris is, you know, the kind of a little bit more spiritual than Chris. And we, you know, he's a little bit more. My feet are on the ground. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I like to think about things. Conversations yeah. about this kind of thing. Yeah. 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 And, and as you, if you might be interested in things of this sort, which you clearly are, not necessarily so ecology, um, I'm currently co editing a book. Uh, which is called Creative Ruptions for Emergent Educational Futures. And that comes out in March 2024, uh, Palgrave Macmillan. So you might want to look out for that, where we, we look at the ruptures, the spaces in which we can make a difference. Uh, and I would argue, for example, that COVID was uh, a waste because we said, oh, we've got to get through this and then we'll return to normal whereas actually it opened up all sorts of opportunities for doing things very differently. Uh, and I think that's a shame we didn't grasp uh, a lot of those nettles during that time. Right. Um, we have a, uh, we've, we've got a kind of lunch break now, believe it or not. Um, there was a question here, which I don't Do we want to fit in? Are, are we, could, could you, could you oh, no, talk no. in the lunch break? Could you well, gather together break, in the lunch break? In, which is you ended on action and positive the answers yeah. are in your book to some extent, but you know, what the curriculum keeps coming back and I like your community of the mesh as a possible design for the But yeah, I'd like to see the curriculum change. What's the what would be the initial step? Yeah. Because it's a big thing. I'd yeah. like to get rid of the students. Yeah. Yeah. I think, sorry. Yeah, well, I was going to say, according to Shaloyning, the, the, the woman who wrote that amazing book about art and politics, she would say, we need to be shocking people. And I think that was coming through in your project where you were saying that young people wanted to face, don't sugarcoat this. We know these bad things are out there. We need to understand. If you don't share this information, how are you going to make a difference? And so, of course, we, you know, we don't want to scare and upset people, but sometimes you have to do that to make a difference, to, 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 to realise the reality. There's a really interesting new book that's been very recently published um, about the um, cobalt mining in the Congo. <laughs> and... If you look into that, there's a video on YouTube. It says everything that is wrong about the green growth agenda, thinking that technology is going to solve the earth crisis because it is not. And I'll end it there. <laughs> but but it, 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 that's that radical, you know, it's so accepted. I'm driving my electric vehicle, saving the environment. Where did all that stuff come from that's powering that major electric vehicle? It didn't come out of fairy dust. It came out of the hands of four-year-old children. Yeah. Uh, can, can I just give... Oh, sorry. Do you want, I'll give you time to try. Uh, um, there, are, there are two examples I think I'd want to uh, suggest. One was many years ago when I was working in schools, we, we started something called a Day 10, where we gave staff the opportunity on Day 10, on a 10-day timetable, of getting themselves together with friends or with interest uh, groups and team teaching whatever they wanted to, and then giving the option to students of being involved with that. Uh, and so once you start to open things up as an experiment, 
And I think experiments are things which in schools people don't do oh, anymore. In case Hofstede comes in and says, well, you're wasting time, day 10. How can you prove that that's good? But actually in that day 10, there were so many exciting things. And I think also you could sort of start this whole thing by having day 10 as an experimental day for addressing some of these issues and getting the staff on board if they're interested in doing that. That sort of thing. The other thing I'd say, and I don't know how much it happens in this country, but I mean, Exeter have sort of been toying with it, is at um, the University of Barcelona, the students got themselves together and were activists, and they actually insisted that all students uh, had a module which was about this very issue, and that no one could opt out of that. It was like going to a Welsh university and having to speak Welsh. Uh, you had to speak with this voice uh, throughout the university. So there are a number of ways of doing it. We're trying to sort of talk to Exeter about trying to, so, I'm sorry, trying to make these sorts of changes. Um, and it's damned hard. Yeah. People don't want to because they feel they're going to be judged. And you've got to prove it can work before it can work. But that's ridiculous because you can't. You can only hope. And if we have hope and we have wonder and we have, <laughs> energy then you can do those sorts of things I think so I think there are ways you can galvanize it in small ways small projects show they're successful and then spread them I mean the work that you could know you, you're doing wrap up now. yeah the yeah. work you're doing as a team I think is doing that oh thank you so much and I just just spoiled that sentence where you were yeah, oh, I should have been but um yeah, because, uh, I mean, there's so much that we can, obviously, so many synergies that are being uh, yeah. demonstrated and connected, and we've got a really vibrant room here. We are still having questions coming in. Jamie, is it Jamie, from, um, is saying, uh, why does the spiritual have to be seen as not grounded? Is it, bi it's, is it binary, mind, conscious, change, imagination, nature? It's a... a I'm not sure if it's meant to be, uh, I think it's sacred, but it says scared. But um, yes, yeah, <laughs> sacred, it comes back in as sacred. And hope, uh, wonder, nature, we are natural. This is the sacred task. So yes, people online are bringing their spirituality. You are here with us in spirit online, people. That's brilliant. And um, so please do come back. Please do come back at 1.30 because uh, we have our wonderful presentations from people international speakers fantastic presentations that uh, as you have registered on eventbrite you will see who's coming up at 1 30 so please do come back and thank you so much for our fantastic you know, speakers uh, and it's a whole, and we have shared so many wonderful words of wisdom and insight with us today so thank you thank you very much thank you In business. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk to you about new models of exhibition making. Um, my name is Elise, I am Head of Exhibitions at the Design Museum and I'm also the Environmental Impact Lead. Um, for those of you who don't work in museums, I hope that instead of being bored by the detail of what I'm going to tell you, you can see it as a case for how to develop change in an organisation. Um, I am not on the curatorial team, so I'm not responsible for content, I'm responsible for the doing, the production, the action. In fact, what we've called this sort of unit that I've developed um, is action research. So I'm not a specialist in environmental or anything. I'm a specialist in exhibitions, but I've been learning so much to try and improve how we do things in museums. I'm just going to set my timer. Okay. So today I'm going to talk to you about an exhibition that we developed a couple of years ago at the Design Museum called Waste Stage, What Can Design Do? Um, and out of that spun an exhibition audit, and out of that spun a toolkit for designers and people working in the sector, out of that spun a report for the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, and then a little bit about where we'd like to go next. So taking you back about two years ago, um, October 2021, uh, again to coincide with COP26, comes up a lot at uh, these talks, 
we developed a major exhibition about the role of design in creating a, a take make waste economy and that exhibition was on for several months and it really catalyzed our thinking around this area so these are just some exhibition views to give you a flavor we looked back um, we looked forward, we had this lovely commission by an artist called Ibrahim Mahama, who's from Ghana. We looked at terribly shocking advertisements. This one's from the 50s. And I'll just give you a moment to read that. This show looked at planned obsolescence. It looked about concepts that today make your eyes water. Someone earlier mentioned electric cars and it showed giant photographs of lithium mines. Um, that are fueling all of these so-called uh, sustainable solutions to this massive crisis that we find ourselves in. Um, we showcased visionaries like Stella McCartney, who's been a pioneer of high-end fashion um, in the high-end fashion space for a very long time. Um, but how could we develop an exhibition knowing that exhibitions use carbon, use stuff, use time, use resources without really knowing what that was? It was really important for us as a museum putting this exhibition in the programme to be joined up and to make sure that we were being credible and that we weren't saying one thing over here to the public, but back of house, no one really understood the impact of our activities. I knew nothing about this at all. To be honest, no one in the museum did. So we thought we'd better learn. We contacted a lovely collective called Urge Collective. They're a team of designers who um, are very committed to helping designers and creative professionals in the face of this climate crisis. Um, they have a range of skills in their collective, and one of the people is a data analyst. So we worked with them to conduct a life cycle assessment of the exhibition, something that people are starting to do now. I think many people had really done it in 2021. Um, we looked at primarily, we, we used carbon as a metric, mainly because you can measure it. And for newbies like us, that felt quite manageable, um, sort of as a, a fresh people learning about this from scratch. Um, the audit aimed to test our assumptions. We realised working on this project that we all had so many assumptions picked up from society, what your neighbour says, what a curator once told you, and most of them turned out to be untrue, basically. We wanted to learn which areas of exhibition making had the greatest impact. Again, there's so much overwhelm. Should we do X? No, that's better than Y, but Y is better than Z. We just wanted to know, should we all be turning our cameras off? when we speak to each other on video chat, or actually should we be focusing on the shipping of objects? Of course, it's the latter, but that just demonstrates the level of utter confusion with people who don't work in the sector of what they're supposed to be doing. Ultimately, we wanted to change our behaviour in museums, as many of you will know, especially temporary spaces. You build walls, you build showcases, plinths, and at the end of the show, I'm ashamed to say, a lot of that goes in the skip. It's shocking. Everybody's very overworked though. You say, can't you store it? Can't you use it again? I don't have time for that. I've got nowhere to store it. We need to just completely change how we produce exhibitions from a design and build point of view. And we wanted to set the benchmark for the future. We wanted to do better. So this was a little, uh, little overview of the audit process. And what did we find? We found that the choice of your content is absolutely uh, crucial in the carbon impact of your exhibition. The Ibrahim Mahama uh, photo I showed you, the big sort of bookshelf with the television, accounted for over 50% of the emissions of the whole show. 30% was in the build. By build, I mean the walls and the bits and bobs that we made from scratch. Working with Urge throughout the whole design development, we were really mindful in the build. They weren't MDF walls that were then chucked away. They were made with the whole context of this exhibition and waste in mind, and still, that was 30% impact. This is the Ibrahim Hummer work. We also learned, and um, I can share these slides afterwards if anyone's uh, interested, like I am, in the very detailed nitty gritty. We learned about our building's energy. Um, we learned about details of how you transport and ship objects and what that means for an exhibition. Uh, we learned about the pros of unfired bricks versus fired bricks. We learned about screws and how their CNC cut means that they use an enormous amount of energy. Um, so we closed the exhibition in February and it's actually gone on tour to so several different venues, which is amazing. Um, but we found 
lots of people then came to us, colleagues in the sector saying, oh, great, what does best practice look like? Um, and even internally, the project team that worked on this exhibition had learned so much, but we have, I, I'm head of exhibitions, I look after about 10 projects a year, so what about everyone else? And we realized we needed to bring these learnings into one place so that we could efficiently communicate them to our peers, to our friends in other museums, and try and standardize what change might look like and support each other on this journey of basically doing better. So we developed a toolkit, which was this exhibition design guide for our time. Um, and it also included an impact model. I'm just gonna run you through what it is. It's available online if anyone would like to uh, download it, it's there for the public. Um, so we looked at how to commission designers, how to talk to contractors, what questions to ask and when, and how to weave in this thinking throughout the whole decision-making process. So you don't get to the end of a project and some helpful person at your kind of penultimate design view says, oh, have we thought about sustainability? It's really to encourage people to embed it from even before concept and research phases. In this design guide, learning from the Ibrahim Mahama, um, which is a, it's a beautiful word, but learning from that experience, we developed um, an object decision tree. So we're really familiar in museums about thinking th of things in terms of how much they will cost from a financial budget. As a project manager by training, as soon as someone says, curator says, oh, it's coming from Japan, it starts to get a bit jumpy, you know, it's going to be really expensive. We should start to have that very intuitive reaction about what things cost to the environment. And so this decision tree is to help our colleagues who are selecting the works to just think about it mindfully. I'm not arguing that we shouldn't ship our works. I can't, with, in, as a museum professional, I can't argue for that. I'm definitely not arguing that we should not exhibit artworks from the global south of course that is not the question the question is how can we do it be more efficient with our environmental budget if you like could we have brought an artist over for a longer period of time and he or she did all sorts of activities in the region could we have invited somebody for a residency to make work with local materials maybe that would not suit their practice at all maybe it would so my invitation to people we've been working with, curators and people producing this kind of cultural output, especially in museums where we really do ship things around the world, is to do it with intention. And this is a tool to help people um, when they're thinking about that. We also have another one, and this is for designers. Um, so at the Design Museum, we don't have an in-house studio. We work with design teams uh, all around the world, really. Um, which is great, but it means we can't just brief one studio with our way of thinking and then they turn it out for every show. We've also found with designers, we would say at the start of a project, we really want you to think about materials and we're really worried about our carbon footprint and everyone say, yes, yes, us too, and then go away and completely forget we had that conversation. So now what we do, when we sit down with the, well, actually before, when we interview, uh, when we appoint, and then when we brief designers, we go through this material decision tree. We answer a series of questions. I won't go through them all, but is it a temporary show? Is it permanent? Is it this? Is it that? Will it talk? And at the end, uh, it spits out what we call a rag. So a list, and that list is a list of materials that they are invited to use, green, probably will need to use red, uh, amber, and please don't let your answer if you have to, red. And we've got four different ones, which tracks not completely because I think it's quite impossible, but it does track some of the complexities of not knowing what to do with the different situation. There are so many arguments that a such and such frame is better in a permanent place or last 10 years versus something else you have to replace three times. And again, all of that kind of overwhelm, it just distills it into kind of clearer pathway towards action and resources. And we've been trialing this with great success, actually. This is an exhibition we opened uh, in May on the Sari. And we did this from, from A to Z with the designers. And these are very low carbon materials that we've used here in the build. Um, you can see fabric, you can see the sort of card um, material, which is partitioning the space. And the mannequins have actually been saved from landfill. 
So it was really wonderful when we got to the point where we were negotiating with the contractors and they said, oh, this is cheaper, that's cheaper. Um, don't you want to do this? It's easier. Our designers were the ones who were like, hang on a minute, what rag are we? Let's just go back. No, can't do that. And we weren't having to persuade them anymore. We'd given them the agency and the information to be able to sort of hold that megaphone for themselves. And what I found is that so many of these designers and contractors they really want to change, they're desperate for change, they just don't know how to do it because it's so overwhelming. So we're really working with them to give them tools and, and help them. It's a journey we're on together. This is an exhibition um, also on view at the moment called Island. It's our designers researching residency programme. Again, this was used with uh, people diligently looking at those rag ratings. Um, we used hemp board. The plinths there are completely compostable. They're actually going to some allotments at the end of the show. And this is another display which just opened uh, last week called How to Build a Low Carbon Home. So this is looking at straw, uh, wood and stone as, I say alternative, they're actually very ancient methods of construction, um, but which have a much, uh, a much better for the earth, uh, to use the words uh, that we've been using today, than our contemporary construction materials of the development uh, new buildings <coughs> using. So I invite you to go and see that, that's on um, until early next year. Um, so in our toolkit, we also have uh, an impact model. So it's, we basically built our own carbon calculator, which was specific for the exhibition industry. So focusing on all of those really tricksy scope three things that no one can ever really grab hold of and measure. And actually in exhibitions, that's what we do all the time. We know how to measure, measure um, our building, our energy, but this is where everything gets a bit murky. And where I'd argue people have just got in the habit of building for throwing away, um, but by measuring it, it just makes it a bit more tangible, a bit more real. And ultimately we can have pie charts like the ones that, the one I showed you before, and hopefully reduce for the future. So this spun out into uh, a report for uh, DCMS. We have a wonderful research unit at the Design Museum called Future Observatory. So it's supporting designers, it's funded by AHRC, uh, supporting designers who are looking to design for the green transition. Um, and they've given us a lot of confidence in my team actually to really tackle these things head on. There's a lot of support internally for this work. Um, and we worked with them to develop this report for DCMS. Um, we've worked with lots of London museums, we invited them to test the guide, we invited them to test our impact model. People like me, project managers love a good spreadsheet, some people are like, oh my gosh, that's so scary, I would never ever use that. So it was really helpful to get a range of um, responses from different people. We did lots of interviews with contractors and said, you know, when you're appointed and we ask a little questionnaire about your sustainability credentials, what does that mean for you? And they came up with really interesting things. Some said, well, you know, there's no point. Everyone just lies. <laughs> or um, it would make much more sense if your question was, if you are a B Corp, don't answer anything else. Don't worry about it. You're independently audited. So it was really interesting to understand as a client, as a museum in the centre of a web of lots of third party contractors, how can we be, I guess, responsive to the fact that Contractors are really time poor. They don't want to answer lots of environmental questionnaires if they already have a really robust strategy. So yeah, these recommendations were really helpful to give us a bit of food for thought and to also um, report back to DCMS with some suggestions. Could we have like a massive warehouse where we all store things we don't use and all of the museums are allowed to just come and get a plinth or a showcase or whatever? It's so simple. It's astonishing that we don't have this, but the museum sector doesn't. And that's something we think could be of great value to everybody. So looking ahead, um, my plan for this year is that, well, what we are doing is benchmarking, using the tools to benchmark all of our exhibition and displays. We talk about kind of carbon budgets because um, it's, it's a term that is familiar and easy for us to understand because we talk about financial budgets all the time. But right now, I don't know what a big or a small budget is really for an exhibition. I know what waste stage was, but that was also developed during the pandemic. No one traveled. I, I just have no idea how to set anything, any carbon budget. So this year we're gonna look at everything, track everything and understand 
like I do really intuitively with financial budgets, I know what 20,000 pounds gets you. I know what half a million pounds gets you. In future, hopefully, I should be able to look at exhibitions and be like, you know what, we're going to move that to a different year because it, it, there's not enough budget for it. Um, I'd love to improve our tools. So the Excel, which some people love, some people less so, I'd love to make that into an easy to use kind of interface. I would love DCMF to invite all of the national museums to use it in their reporting. I would love Arts Council England to invite all of their NPOs to use it. We work really closely with Julie's Bicycle, who we love. Um, and this is something just chatting to them, to the VA. All of us know we need something, but we're not quite there yet. But that's on my to-do list. And then, you know, we tour exhibitions a lot. How can we make touring better? <laughs> um, looking at some more tools in a similar vein, decision trees, documents, things to help guide process. So that process is more intentional, more mindful, and ultimately reduce, reduce, reduce. I just wanted to finish on a quick note, because this is really interesting. We've been talking a bit today around collective action. Um, we're a member of the South Ken Zen Plus group. Uh, with there are 22 members of the Exhibition Road Cultural Group, so in South Kensington, um, and we've all joined forces together. We've been working together for a little over a year, and the idea is that we want to become an exemplar of a low emission neighbourhood. To use the wording from the website, we want to join together with collective voice, collective action, collective bargaining tools. We're all very close geographically. And I have really strong hopes for this organisation because I think it's a wonderful example of how, when you work together, you can be greater than the sum of your parts. And then just to finish some resources in case uh, anyone at home wants to screenshot it or take some photos, we've got Julie's bicycle and everything we do in this, this area. You know, I stand on the shoulders of giants. Julie's bicycle have been doing it for much longer than me. And they are... Uh, up there in, in my opinion the gallery climate coalition again who are just absolutely wonderful people they have a brilliant um carbon calculator tool mainly for galleries and smaller institutions they are also looking to develop one for museums so we're chatting to them and they've got a brilliant decarbonization action plan for arts and culture sector it's a beast but you can just drop into it and it's fantastic um not sure if we've got many sort of object people in the room, but UKRG have some good resources. Uh, the Ljubljana Design Biennale that Urge Collective worked on, and my favourite uh, Rethink podcast, which is very inspiring. And finally, Museums Association, Barbican, we were talking about some of their programmes earlier today. Um, then we've got the Design Museum, this is, this is my toolkit, well, our toolkit, South Kenzen, and then the Future Observatory, which is the unit that I mentioned um, that is really pioneering this work with us. And that's it. Any questions? No, sit down then. Have we not done it? back uh, doing intention, shifting of intention or something, mm. that's what I wrote down. I'm not sure what they wrote that down there. Is it something about, I mean, it was well, like, um, what's the work I've done in the past is always about convincing people that climate change is real or that, you know, you need to just hear the facts and then you change your minds. But we sort of live in a post-Trump era where it, there's so much misinformation. So this way, I think, What's nice about it is in a way people do just tend to take the information and learn by themselves. Other things to mention is like we, like, it, it was really quite complicated to get people to film their everyday lives. We had to give them some examples. And as soon as you give someone an example, they tend to copy that example. And also, there was a sort of debate from some of the participants about how interesting or you know everyday life would be sexual representation but that's it is all the same but what they didn't realize is seeing people in different countries and, and still having the same concerns is actually brought us together more um also we got lots of footage sometimes we, we've got over 100 interviews now and some of them are four hours long and some of them are 
Right. So, so how, and this is really where this is what we're unstuck at in a way. We've, we've created a conduit or a container to take this information about how do we exhibit this. It's like, um, we, you know, already it's text heavy. I hate it on a one screen thing because it should be on multiple screens where you can wander around, but everybody wants to show it as a film and we're sort of putting a stop to that now. Or we're actually making it more expensive to the information to it. It's like, I hate the idea that people write these stories and then we have to sort of edit them down as short as possible. That way is the films. They're, we haven't, you know, it's very much work in progress at this day. And how long does it last and how long is, you know, doing this? And I think the thing that for me, I was, and I've talked to a few people earlier, um, I, I found, you know, uh, climate anxiety, one of the things, I found it very hard reading books. Maybe the Wallace Wells, you know, in in for Earth and things like that, and, and I was thoroughly depressed. So the book that sort of lifted me was a book, 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 book uh, uh, Human Kindness. And this is really where it inspired me to think about a positive. Thing. There's a line in it which we use, and it's like a better world doesn't begin with me, but all of us. And I think um, yeah, it's just um, yeah. I think any questions. So basically, um, it was, it was. Right, can we stop the sound? Oh yeah, let's turn the sound down. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Can't hear as well. Oh yeah, I forgot to do that. Um, how about that? Yeah, I think that's better. Um, so, um, well, we wanted it to be quite a slightly random, but it was a very rushed application. I worked because we needed partners. Um, the British Council put it, put it through, and it was like a very short turnaround. And they weren't even sure what they wanted. It was some digital online presence. They weren't even sure themselves. They admitted because of COVID, they didn't know. They couldn't say what it was going to be because they didn't know what was going to happen. Um, so we worked. We just. Um, I did a workshop with Next in Liverpool, and I said, yeah, we, uh, I had an intern who was from Lebanon, and I spoke to her. And I had a friend who moved to Vietnam, who's teaching in Vietnam, and I got him as a partner. So they were basically friends, and people in Brazil. We've been doing some. So my background is um, audio visual performances, and I've done some performances in Brazil and in the past, and and the other ones Indonesia. We did some, and, and that's where we um. So basically, chose partners, people we knew, we could, it, it, we were ready to work with. It was quite a rush, and we didn't actually even really properly know what we were going to do. We knew we were going to get people in. I was quite inspired by Mike. Can you come back here? Oh, microphone. Yeah, because the thing is, the people that oh, that so video sorry, yeah. did not screen, although we had it on screen. Share, can, we can send a link. We'll something. send the yeah. link to everybody you online. Have the, don't you? Because the Vimeo. Uh, anyway, I'll yeah, send. Yeah, we'll, we'll send the link. I'm sorry for the people at home who haven't seen that, but um, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. What was I saying? I know, okay, let's get another question. If you were talking about Oh yes, yes, so so they yeah, so basically it took a while to transform from an online thing. So we didn't really know we always wanted it as an immersive installation, but we sort of had that in our mind, so we built towards it. But, um but yeah, they it was quite yeah, it was quite difficult. It was, I mean I, I built it so we didn't really mass it didn't really matter about what content we got, it still looked reasonably good. So even it's filmed on really bad cameras. No, that was the inspiration from the 80s. There was a photography agency who went into, I think it's somewhere in Honduras, where they just gave cameras to people in the favelas, to children, and to get them to collect pictures. And they really collected these sort of candid shots. And I really like this idea that you could just get eyes on the ground without going around filming. It, it, it felt to me a little bit imperialistic. And because it is the British Council, uh, I know some of these countries in the past we've worked with, I've actually felt that. So we really wanted to give it give it out to them and let them have control. So we, we set some parameters for the filming, but it was totally loose. So they got they got to choose basically. We didn't really, it doesn't matter because it was just random really. But I think as the project evolves now, one thing we do have a weakness of is, is, is particularly wealthy people. And we are getting through to a few, we've got, um, uh, we've got one guy whose friends, his dad's an oil um, director, but he hates his dad and he's going to film. 
So we're trying to get these people in because we, well, in a way, it's, I think what's interesting is it's very easy to demonize these people at the top, but they, their just perspective of life is um, different, really. And I, and I can talk to them from experience when, when my daughter was at nursery, it was, there was some people there who worked at this horrible legal company as a corporate thing and, they, and, and it's interesting their perspective about they weren't really necessarily bad people they just had a, a, a really sort of an environment that encouraged them to sort of be focused on money and power and it, it, it's interesting how they had no yeah, but they didn't really have any ethics but it's like the point is, <laughs> i'm not allowed to say that no um, right Oh, sorry, yeah. But, um, this, is, this is kind of going back to the whole concept as well, for people who haven't seen it online, but to clarify, why is it called Nine Earths? I mean, you had these kind yes. of... Yes, so if you, you live said in... If you yeah. live in Qatar, it would be Nine Earths, but how? Okay. And then, just to, to kind of recap a little yeah, bit... Yes, so it's an basis. ecological footprint. Yeah. So, basically, if if you lived in Qatar, you'd be consuming Nine Earths with the resources. So, we, if, if the entire... And how long would it take to do that? Um, well, it, it, they do it by calendar as well, so okay. it'd probably be February or something. So, so a year. Well, within a year, you're using nine years worth of resources. So if, if you took it as a water well and each year it replenished, you'd be going down, 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 down. So there's, there comes a point when there's no resources left. So we are currently, I think, 1.8 globally. So every year we're running into debt. So those, and, and you can see that because the, the, the planet is being destroyed. And and I think what's interesting is people I keep as people I talk to who aren't really interested in climate change are beginning to see that. You know, I had a friend who went to Borneo or something, and she said it's like you said, Mike, it's all palm palm oil and, and no forest, you know. And so and I and I think something else to just give you a backdrop to my story in a way, and really which is, sort of resonates in my past, in my twenties. I sort of travelled for a couple of years, and I did it by land mass purely because of the cost implications. Not not across the oceans and stuff, but every possible point was either a bus, train, or car. So, like, I drove from across America, I drove down to Mexico and around. But I, uh, so, I, and then I did the Trans Siberian, and then boats in China and trains. And I and one thing that always resonated to me was like how small the world was. Everyone talks about it being huge. But everywhere I went, and this was in the 80s, I saw people. I mean, yeah, sure, it's a train line and there's going to be towns, but but I just felt it's not as big as we all make it out. And we really do push this idea that the world's huge when it's when it, when we've got a problem. But when it's convenient and small, it's small when we want to go for a weekend in Hong Kong, but it's big when there's a big problem. And and I think I feel that that's I feel the core of lots of this environmental stuff is the fact we have no perception of scale. And we have this one planet and it's like, and, and you know, when people go out to space, they have nervous breakdowns because they start to realize that is our planet, you know? And I think that's something that, that we're not told that because we're told about economic growth and talk about everything is perpetual. It's like, no one's talking about, you know, when it runs out in an econ in, in econo economic sense. Right? Yeah. Um, still got a few more minutes if you're quite Yeah, four minutes. It's a luxury to have any questions, fine. So, what's your topic? Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, that's right. Not really questions. <laughs> I really enjoyed this stuff yesterday. I watched it. Oh, but it's very nice to see the sort of banality of people just eating. And, and yeah, totally. What they will do. And, and that it's also very nice to have empathy with everyone actually in this. That's class. exactly what it was meant to do. And it also shows you that other people worry. You know, you, you tend to think it's only ours or it's them yeah. and they don't care and they do care, but everybody does. But just yesterday, I happened to watch the Savvy and Dummy, but it was quite a good film. It's sort of you know, doing Saloon type sort of style, but it was about the people who were trying to get out of the private jet, which in Dummy and I can imagine exploding in the last mm. three or It was just.
Yeah, yeah. and it, because we're so this aspirational lifestyle, aren't we? That's yeah, where yeah, we're yeah. Com constantly bombarded with that stuff. A lot of them, by the way, were people who were only pretending to be rich. They're just quite interesting. Like, yeah. They find all these self people like who are all uh, uh, um, online, you know, influencers or something or uh, some class member, some category where you make a lot of money at the restaurant. And they're just, and they're all selling themselves, and then they have to constantly film themselves, being flying around practice show that they were really rich but they weren't actually that <laughs> I mean, that but it, and i think it's also that thing where people don't know as well yeah. it's like um in when we talked about showing us at, at cop 26 yeah people didn't know what cop 26 was you know that's even when it's on the news and in the newspapers in the uk it's like and, and i find that sometimes you have to have those moments and realize that we're in this room we're in this bubble and and out there they don't care and they but they they know something's wrong that's the thing they deep down they know something's wrong because things are getting bad in many in every aspect you know privatization neoliberalism yes um, um cop 28 if you've heard of it people haven't yeah. it's uh, in dubai this year totally and we're not going <laughs> spotted that qatar is like code yeah. red, you know, nine, nine. Yeah, I think Dubai is eight. Eight, yeah. And yeah. so I suppose the question is, and, and funnily, you know, the title of the next show presentation is Art Saved World. You know, can your film really, you know, not just showing that those, those inequalities of footprint, but how can it lead to activation to really do something about those inequalities? And to really target those high, high emitting countries like Qatar and Dubai. Can I, sorry, yeah. can I ask a question about that? Because I am from Egypt and I have a very close connection to Dubai. It is quite good, actually. Because there's no consumer power as much as in yeah. the world, right? But but COP26 was in Dubai. I mean, UK is one of the higher consumer. Well, well, okay, so there's obviously there's a carbon footprint and then there's a biological footprint. Right. And, and of course, there, and, and I've always said that consumption drives climate change. Mm -hmm. But um, it's about, yeah, it is about lifestyle and and stuff. But we're, you know, we're about 2.6 or something, 2.3, you know, it's still bad. But actually, places like Germany, Australia's like way off, Russia's high, um, US. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Wondering whether the best action is to, is, is to boycott or to say no, right? Because I have this very contentious yeah. relationship with COP27, which is obviously to do this. And my issue, my, my, my issue is one, my debate of wanting to, I know this is like that, sorry, of wanting to go or not, but because of the political stand and, and me being a gypsy woman, not being able to express myself freely without fear. But then I, other people weren't going with the, you know. And there's a question so, isn't it best to go and have your voice heard? And, yeah. That's the, that's, yeah, I mean, sorry, I, I, I just want to sidetrack it because I think, well, it is, I think the whole point is, is and I think the number one thing we're putting the solution is talk about climate change. Mm. Because the more we talk about it, the more people rush us. Even just talking to people about this, right, about my project, they, as soon as you say the nine years is what they do, they, their brain just drops, the penny drops, they go, oh my God, is this true? You know, it's like, so it's, that's the thing. But the other thing to say is it, it is only the 10% within each country. So it's not like, you know, just because you're, you know, it's not us as 2.4, it's other people. Some people will be lower, but it is generally on the consumption and this idea of endless consumption, it's like, it's, yeah. I'm really glad that your project uses ecological footprint because I don't use it enough. No. Everyone talks about carbon, and that is well, and then it's a really exciting and important thing. Yeah, but it's about consumption because if we consume less, then it's okay. You know, we can sustain probably 10 billion people on that if we consume, if we live like this, we live 10 years or something. But nobody wants to downgrade. There's this idea of buying, buying your, and that's what I hear from. A group of them, they have many different groups, and they're all, it's all about them doing the right thing by buying the car, recycling, and buying it and go on holiday. But it, it, there, is a, there is a slight disconnect about how your impact is. And, that, and there's another book, uh, Bill Marshall's, um, How Our Brains Are Hot Wires for 
there's more fun in Canada. And it is about it's very difficult yeah. because if you have to go and fly across the world to see relatives, you know, it was like how does that equate to you know other things? And it's 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 not it, yeah, it's quite it's it's not it's not a binary fix. That's the thing. It's about gradual. It, it's the degrowth. It's um it's changing our lifestyles through a different way. I mean, if you had a label on everything you wore. Mm -hmm. Hello everyone, this is a hard act to follow, um, but I'm Amy Hart and I, I have my cat and I don't know if um, I'm going to explain more, um, but essentially what I've been talking about and researching is Art Save the World, exploring how art can be a tool for the climate crisis, um, after all the conversations today, also the plus side can be for the crisis, so working on my terminology a little bit more, um, you've definitely given me a lot to think about, so thank you for that. Um, so who am I? I'm from the United States, um, and I'm a Thomas J. Watson Research Fellow, which is from the founder of IBM. Happy to talk about that more, but I really want to get through the important stuff today, so you're welcome to ask questions about that later. I'm from Rhode Island, which is on the unceded Wampanoag lands, um, and I'm a visual artist, researcher, and an environmental teacher. I also talk very quickly, so if I speak too quickly, just go slow down. Okay. Um, so why that is relevant um, is because for my fellowship, I have spent the last year traveling around the world um, to these different places to focus on the intersection of arts and the environment. One of the rules of the Watson Fellowship is you're not allowed to return to the U.S. for a year. So it's really much focused on what's going on in other countries and then to apply some of that knowledge and those connections um, when I return. Obviously, huge carbon <laughs> emissions that I'm traveling here too, so I'm happy to talk about how I've been trying to figure that out in my own experience. Um, but I've really been trying to spend as much time in each place, um, except for in Europe, I've gone around a little bit more, but um, at least a few months in each place. As you'll notice too, it's all over the world. So some of the things that I looked at in my research was really going to different places that are um, small islands to you know, bigger countries, um, landlocked countries as well. And then um, <laughs> places that have different types of art, really just to see what dialogues are going on in these places. What are the artists talking about? How does that influence policy? How does that influence the environmental work that's going on? And really, what are people talking about in these different areas? Um, so let's get started. Here are my two research questions. There's two main things that I've been focusing on within arts and the environment. Obviously, very, very broad topics. So the first one is, what materials are environmental artists using um, and designers using? I will explain exactly what I mean by artists and environment. Um, that's the first question. I don't have time to tell you all about this. I would love to, but welcome to ask me about this later. The one that I'm gonna be talking to you today um, about is called is the role of art in catalyzing environmental change. So what does that look like? Or more simply, can art help the climate crisis? And if so, how? Obviously we know that it can, but it's a question, so I can't obviously say. I'm um, trying to you know, see what, what role it plays. Um, I'm obviously biased, I'm an artist myself, so I really wanted to see what are the different aspects. Um, and a little you know, disclaimer, most of what I'm gonna be talking about today is not going to be earth shattering as you all are working in the field. So I'm really excited to actually be able to ask you all what you think about um, the role that art can play and you know, how we can work together um, within these disciplines. So some definitions. Am I speaking too quickly? It's okay, great. <laughs> art, when I'm speaking about art, I'm talking about visual art, performance, music, textile, poetry, writing, craft. Um, I don't make a distinction between, you could say, it's like fine arts and craft. I really wanted to see what is going on in the space. I am a visual artist, so that has been a little bit more of my focus. Um, it just honestly was a little bit easier to find visual artists in my research. So there's definitely a bias towards that. But I've also found that performance and music in particular, and, and writing as well, um, are really um, powerful tools within the climate sphere and within the um, art sphere as well. Second definition is the environment. So oftentimes when I tell people what I'm researching, they go, what? Huh? I don't really understand, and I totally understand because it's so broad. But some of the different topics that I've focused on or, or that I've 
learned about in speaking with different artists and activists and organizations are on biodiversity, water rights, climate justice, plastic pollution, indigenous practices, biomaterials, so much more. But just wanted to give you an idea of some of the different conversations I've been having. Um, I've also noticed too that some of these conversations are really um, country specific. So for example, in Chile, uh, bio, um, biomaterials is a big conversation there's a lot going on as well as here. Um, lots of stuff going on with fungi, fungi as well in Chile. So um, versus maybe in Zambia, there's a little bit more talk about plastic pollution and you know, making art from those types of materials. Also water rights in Chile is a big one. Make a difference, what does that mean? So um, I actually have more questions for you than I have answers for this one. Um, that's something I've been thinking about throughout the course of this year. What does it mean to make a difference? How do we measure that? I had a great conversation with Emma yesterday who unfortunately couldn't be here, but she basically does research on how, you know, what's the impact that um, museum exhibits have on the viewer. And so I'm excited to talk to her a little bit more about that. Um, also on what time scale, right? So let's say if you go to an exhibit or you um, go to an art workshop or art obviously happens in so many different spaces, but maybe you won't experience the impact or you won't feel impacted immediately. Um, maybe it'll take, I don't know, 10 years and, and you'll think about something that came up from that exhibit um, and it will impact your team. Also, who is being impacted, right? So as an artist myself, um, I don't know why I make art, but I love to make art. And so I'm, I'm often feeling changed by the art that I make. Um, and also, of course, a lot of times art is focused or exhibits are focused on impacting the viewer. So that's something to would love to hear your thoughts on this as well. So my methods, um, mostly through interviews and studio visits, I really um, was able to spend time both in some short periods of time and sometimes days or weeks with different artists and organizations and um, activists. That was really wonderful, focusing on all sorts types of different materials from, you know, um, harakiki weaving in New Zealand, uh, using recycled glass bottles to make chandeliers in Zambia, um, using fungi to make cups in Chile, um, making pigments from natural plants in Taiwan, and then um, using recycled um, car parts and things like that again in, in Zambia. So just a few little snippets. Um, another way that I have really been um, doing this research is through workshops, exhibits, residencies, and conferences today. Um, so uh, a lot of the workshops I have been lucky to be able to participate in, and then also some that I've been able to lead myself. Um, done at two different residencies, one in um, Atacama Desert, so I was excited to see that mentioned a little bit earlier, um, which is really interesting space in Chile, and then one in Taiwan, um, and one residency type thing in, in Indonesia as well. So my findings. So these are six ways um, that art can make a difference. Obviously, you probably know a lot of these already. I just really want to see does the um, what I'm seeing on the ground reflect what we think is happening in the site. I'm non-academic, um, so I keep my terms very simple. Um, but please, you know, feel free to challenge me and, and the terms that I use. I really appreciate feedback as well. So I will go through briefly these six different ways. I'm also changing this, right? So this is really a working breathing document. I'm about one month left in my research, oh, two weeks left before I have to go back to the state, sadly. Um, so this is kind of what I've seen so far, but even um, the conversations of talking about impact, you know, I'll, I'll keep thinking about it afterwards. So um, first one is educate. So I would like you all to look at these two illustrations that I've done. I want you to take a second and see if you can figure out what's going on. Anybody wants to guess? No wrong answers. Nice. Very close. You know what the shape looks like? Like I'm from the US. Mm. Oh, so close. Um, so yeah, if you're on the right, it's an insect. It's a tick. So ticks are a big issue in the US. You don't have ticks here, I believe. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, we're on so sorry for you. Ticks are a huge issue um, in, the, in the eastern part of the state, which is where I'm from. And where I went to university in upstate New York, this is a map of New York City. Um, and so where I went to university, um, I live in a very rural community that 
So, you know, it's a really liberal arts school. Um, as soon as you get outside, there's huge Trump signs everywhere and huge agricultural fields. And so in my environmental degree, I focus on working on a thesis, talking with the dairy farmers and trying to figure out, you know, what do you think about climate change? Do you think there's an issue? A lot of them don't believe in climate change. It's a few years ago, I really hope it's changed. No, it has. Um, so inspired by that, I decided to do my art thesis on trying to use art as an educational tool. And my hope was by having people look at these things, um, it would maybe draw them in a little bit. So you might say, oh, those are ticks, or those are bugs, or lice, or whatever. What is going on? Um, so I'll tell you, this is the recorded Lyme disease cases in 1996, um, and then the recorded Lyme disease cases in 2018. Huge issue. Um, Lyme disease is incredibly hard to track, to diagnose, and to treat. Um, so I wanted to show that it's spreading really, really rapidly. Obviously, it's an artistic interpretation, um, but I included big pieces of text in with that as well. That was one part of the exhibit that focused on biodiversity of cows and dairy production. Um, so that's really where I started with my my own art practice, including environment in it. Um, there are lots of examples. I'm just going to talk about a few. Um, this was one group that I spent quite a bit of time with in Tanzania. It's called Sakura Theater Groups. Uh, sensitization Education Through Kundal Arts. So they're an awesome group that is all focused on using performance um, in the small rural villages in Zambia to educate the different uh, communities on issues including uh, HIV and AIDS. They did a COVID pandemic one. Um, they do Climate, the climate crisis, plastic pollution, you know, any issue that's really going on in the community. Um, and they use really fun, engaging skits. The whole crowd is laughing. All the kids come running whenever they're around. Um, so it's a really fun way to engage people. I think theater is awesome, music as well. Kind of brings us in that level. But uh, it's been really great to see the impact of that. So hopefully my, my little images that take simulated your curiosity. Um, but it also can engage different types of learners. Reading academics out there, that's awesome. But reading a really big, long, you know, 20 page article for me is a little bit more challenging. Um, so maybe art, obviously, you know, can engage with different types of learners. Um, also, it's a little bit more non confrontational. So, what I noticed when I put my exhibit up um, in, the, in the museum was that a lot of the staff who are from the area and are very conservative might not um, have wanted to talk to me had I talked about the climate crisis. However, when I showed these pictures of the, the moose and the ticks and other photos that I didn't show you today, they were like, can I buy your art? Like, I really want to talk to you about this. And so I was really interested because I'm hoping to you know, find a different way to reach, to find a way to reach different groups. All right, next one. Connect. Um, so this is really one of the biggest ways that I think that art can um, help with the environmental uh, world um, is that um, it connects us to community, to other people. So a lot of workshops um, and exhibits can bring people together to talk about, you know, their, have their feeling, connect us with our emotions, um, connect us to transdisciplinary. We've definitely talked about that today. Um, and also, you know, with, with the more than human world, thank you for that, I would have said nature, but more than human world. Um, so, you know, through making art and through experiencing it as well, um, there's some great projects. The Plum Tree Creek Project is an awesome project that really um, brought the community together for I think, five years um, to work with educators and activists and artists and kind of talk about this Plum Tree Creek and, and why it's been really covered, covered over um, and all the plastic pollution that's going on with that. And so they would bring students out into the area um, and also community members. And it was really incredible. So you should definitely look at that. I also am happy to, you know, share um, the names of the organizations and try and you know, uh, put them on your radar or whatnot and, and introduce you if you're interested because they're all doing great work. Um, so community workshops as well. Um, there the Prebo mural, mural in Chile. Um, so not sure if you all are aware, but Chile uh, was trying to pass a new constitution this uh, September. Unfortunately, it didn't follow through. Um, but the new constitution would have been great for indigenous rights, water rights, um, and it would have been very radical in what it was trying to uh, achieve, and also for climate. Um, so I was really lucky to be able to participate in painting this mural with a bunch of people, and you know, obviously I didn't know any of them beforehand, um, and was really grateful. Just uh, making art together brings people um, together in a, in a fun way to be able to explore. So connect next one. 
then please pause too, if, or pause me if you, if you have any questions, but um, to heal. So this kind of um, is related to community, um, but when I talk to artists, oftentimes they would talk about how it heals them, right? So um, we all have different reasons for making art, um, but for Lorella Dovery, for example, she talks a lot about um, how the process of making art was really helping her to heal the her own, um, I would say, like soul nostalgia to use the word from yesterday, um, and you know, um, feelings of, of loss and sadness with the environmental um, earth crisis. Chung Long Art Lab, if I had time, would love to talk about that. Um, and then also just bringing people together to make art. So I've noticed that a lot of us, um, a lot of people will say, well, I'm not an artist, I can't make art. Um, everyone can make art. Um, and so, you know, just bringing people together in an informal way to work on collective canvases is something that I've been doing a lot of. Um, and after that experience, a lot of people were like, this is so fun, I want to do this again. And so it's great when I had left a few weeks later, they, they sent me a photo and said, we did another art day. Um, so, it was, um, so it can heal us as both artists and participants. It can also provide space to process, reach out, and reinvigorate. Um, so the reinvigorate part is really relevant to Chunglong, which is a really small community in Taiwan. Um, they were hit by a major series of typhoons, but prim primarily Typhoon Wayne in 1986. It used to be a really big rice farming area, um, and these typhoons completely destroyed the seawalls, and so they flooded the area, making their whole livelihoods completely ready to destroy. Um, so the villagers actually adapted, it's a great story, they adapted to shellfish. Um, so now there's a huge oyster community there. And not only was this um, a process of adapting both for um, the farmers, but there also was a whole influx of artists. And so there was this art lab called Changwang Environmental Arts Lab um, that unfortunately is no longer running, but I can connect with the person who is um, in charge of it, she's wonderful. And so basically what they did was they brought in a bunch of different artists just to make environmental art. So the technical term of environmental art usually is using natural materials in the environmental space. Um, so this would be a great example. Um, this is the one that was done in, I think, last year, 2022 or 2021. Um, but they essentially revitalized the space. And by bringing all this art to this area and working with the community to make art as well, um, it kind of helped to shift the narrative from a place that has lost so much um, and lost its sense of identity to actually bring some energy and excitement there. Um, and so uh, what QQ May, who was the former director of the art lab, was telling me was that actually a lot of people have come to this area to try and see if they can use some of the tools that they learned from um, the arts initiatives here to reinvigorate other, reinvigorate other communities. Um, so that's really wonderful, and I have a more in-depth article about it on my website if you are interested. They are really, really great. Thank you. Okay, this one I'm still in process with because I don't really like how I'm wording it, so I would love your thoughts. Um, obviously, art can provide income. It wasn't something I really expected to find necessarily, um, but I was really interested to see how a lot of artists around the world are using the found materials to make, um, make money, essentially. Um, so one example would be in Zambia. Um, there are a lot of initiatives that, uh, let me see if I can find them, wrote them down. Project Luangwa, Tribal Textiles, Sashemo Beads, and Mulberry Mongoose. Um, they're all using different, I would say, traditionally like waste materials. So recycled, so glass, which, which is not recycled there. Um, there's not the facilities for it. There's glass, there's the metal parts. Um, Frederick Curie who's using the car parts that I talked about. Um, people who are using coaching wire as well. There's a big issue with coaching in Zambia. Um, and so there's some individuals and organizations that are collecting this coaching wire, using it to make jewelry, and then selling it to tourists. So this is why it's a little bit more complicated than um, I'm showing right here or have time to talk about. Um, but it's pretty cool to see how they're maybe indirectly or, or directly, you know, um, also helping to clean the environment and to protect these spaces. Um, there's also a big issue with, with logging as well. And so um, my hope is that in being able to support more artists, um, gives them more resources to not have to, to log in that area. It's a huge issue of deforestation in Zambia in general. Okay, almost done. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, Inspire. So this is one that I've really focused more on in the last 
half of my year um, because I think this is where I want to want to put my energy. Um, for some amazing artists. So um, I was lucky to actually judge at the New Design Festival or New Design um, Expo two weeks ago, and where I saw the potato starch la um, lamp, which is there's so much exciting stuff going on in the new material space. Happy to talk more about that as well, but um, it can really inspire us to think about what materials we're using um, and how we can use it in new ways. Again, also in London, it's been a wonderful time here. Thank you all for having me. <laughs> um, the Bear Project. So they do um, experiential art that's all focused on you know, coming together, imagining what a utopia could look like uh, through multiple different sensory experiences. Um, they are based in the UK in general. You should check them out as well. And then again, with biomaterials, um, as I talked about using soil. So Marco Rapetti goes all around Chile, collects soil samples, and then turns them into pigments. Really cool because if you think about each country or each region has a different color palette. So it's kind of a fun thing to explore. And then in my own art, I'm not going to talk too much about my own art, but I've been making art as well throughout the course of this year and was um, invited to create plastic costumes for a festival. Um, so they have a bunch of, uh, Taiwan is one of the biggest producers of plastic. So it's kind of interesting to be using um, plastic that we collected and recycled um, to turn it into costumes. And so that's using uh, bubble wrap, milk cartons, plastic bottles, all sorts of things. And I have a whole series of different ones. It was really fun as well and playful. Um, so that was just a way to think about how do we use these materials? How are we currently using them? And how else can they be used? Um, so my last one is to disrupt, which we've also spent a little bit of time talking about today. Uh, I was really lucky to be able to kind of um, spend time with the last whaling station in Iceland. They're an artist activist organization that's been really working to ban whaling um, in, in Iceland in general. There's really only one uh, company that's whaling right now. And it's really, you should keep looking in the space if you're interested because they, I was there about a week before the, the permit was supposed to come out. Um, and they've been spending the last like year or so doing documentaries and advocacy and they partnered with York as well to do like a, a festival. Um, and then the day before the permit was supposed to come out, the governor or the, I'm not exactly sure who was in charge in terms of the permit, basically put a temporary hold on it. Um, and so now they're in the process of reviewing it, the ethics of whaling, um, because the, I should also clarify, right? So the whaling in Iceland um, is not done by indigenous people. It's done by one white man who mostly sells all of his stuff to Japan. He loses a ton of money in the process. That's not for financial reasons. Um, it's just for story. So that should be perfect. Um, but you should also look, look into them. They do great stuff. Um, and then I also led some of my own workshops, both in New Zealand and in Norway, kind of focusing on how can we use art as a tool to imagine where we want to go. So a lot of um, what I've experienced in eco design, we talked a little bit about that today, was kind of like, ah, oh, art can't do anything <laughs> um, some part of this year. Um, and I kind of realized, well, how can we use art to shift the narrative? I think if you ask people what the future is going to look like for the most part, they will probably say, oh, it's going to be terrible. And here's all the things that could go wrong and whatnot. Um, and so this is nothing new to most of you. But, you know, I was thinking, how can we imagine where we want to go, right? Because if we don't know where we want to go, how are we going to get there? Um, so that was two different workshops that I did. And then I also was really lucky to participate in Katie Rubin's workshop. Um, in um, also in the UK, and she does incredible work using theater to inspire legislative action. Uh, she's from the US, but I think moved here somewhat recently. Um, and she's wonderful and, and actually like tries to um, model different scenarios so then enact um, real life change that makes sense. So it can really just shift our frameworks, challenge dominant narratives, um, and I'm sure lots of other things as well. Thank you. So that's really what I've done. I really talked your ear off. Um, I'm happy to connect you um, with anyone because honestly, for me, what um, justifies my traveling all around the world is trying to be able to be a bridge. I noticed in a lot of these countries that people weren't actually talking to each other. Um, and so I would say, oh, have you heard of this organization? And they'd be like, no. Um, so I was like, okay, let me connect you to you. Um, so I would really love to be able to you know, share um, what these awesome people are doing around the world so that you can work with them as well. Um, that is my information. Um, I'm currently working with Plastic Free in 
um, in the UK, there's a new startup that's all focused on biomaterials and you know, shipping away from plastic. So, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen. So well traveled. Amazing. Traveling you. projects you've uh, discovered and shared with us. Thank you very much. Any okay. Questions? No, it's hard to hear that. Yeah. Um, I think it was in your education yes. part. Uh, you talked about art as a way of um, appealing to different types of learners. Yeah. Which I found, I found the wording quite interesting on that because yeah. usually, like, um, I don't know, we kind of tend, tend to think about different types of audiences. Yeah. Whereas you talk about different types of learners mm. and just like thinking about semantics, when we talk about audiences, that implies kind of like a passive consumption of performance or like a film you're watching, whatever. Oh. Whereas like a learner implies something more, more of an active engagement and yeah. kind of the implication of like anybody can be a learner, it's just like anybody can learn, it's just like kind of different levels of engagement. Yeah. Is, is that something, am I kind of reading too deep? I was a science student, so maybe that's just my focus. And I think that um as someone who like it doesn't learn in certain ways, I think I was focused more on that, right? So that's interesting. I, I really appreciate that. It was not intentional necessarily. Um, but I love that. Yeah, like I'm gonna use it in the future. Thank you. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yeah. Sorry, uh, <laughs> me having no, not been here before, but uh, that's my last question. But I um just I'm just really interested in what you're saying about impact because I happen to be now I'm director of research in my department and uh, all UK universities have to nowadays so just think that you must impact. Yeah. And it's, it, and it's a very narrow definition. And it's all I just had two meetings yesterday and the day before on impact. And yeah, it, it's I just think it, it's something worth to. I love your lecture. I really like your breakdown of this right? on the one heel, heel connect and I mean, that was a really good way of thinking about different kinds of impact and I might just send it back to our rest to have some impact in that direction. Happy to share this as yeah. Well. yeah but it's also just because with impact I when I all the different things I've done I've been thinking about a lot about because it makes you everything you add for me it starts with some great idea and then yeah. it usually comes to one percent of what you think you might achieve but somehow by now i feel that one percent is also it's not something and we don't exactly. know what it's but it's not the measurable sort of how many people the sort of quantitative yeah. evidence yeah. so but yeah it's just interesting thank you yeah i appreciate that mm -hmm. and also do we need to measure i think you talked about that a little bit yeah. earlier like oh, we need to measure the impact and how do we do that sorry. Sorry. Yeah. no 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 that was great yeah. it's definitely something i'm thinking um, this is going back to this idea of thinking otherwise that we we were talking yeah. about earlier. And so for me, you know, I was talking about the historical being a way of thinking otherwise, but I really appreciated the way you're bringing in neurodiversity because I think that that's been a key, key area mm -hmm. that within education can support neurodiverse learners. Um, and I remember when I started my MA, I can't remember what it was, if it was an autistic person, but she was talking about how the water touched her. It was a YouTube oh. video we were watching. We were, I can't remember what theorist we were, but there's some abstract theorist really hard to read. And we were watching these YouTube videos about this woman talking about how the water was touching her. And it was a fundamental change. Yeah. And I thought that was really a powerful thing that came up in your presentation as well as, so I had three things. I was thinking otherwise from when you were presenting historical um, neurodiversity, but also cultural difference. Mm. And so I think that indigeneity is just key. Uh, Absolutely. Orally transmitted knowledge systems that this is, knowledge that we need to start valuing um, and listening to and and sharing yes somehow. absolutely so it's really a wonderful presentation it's really interesting thank you about the work you're doing because i think there is this way um that we feel so disconnected from what's going on in the global south yeah um and i'm developing a module in which i'm we're covering the whole globe and it's really scary yeah and also really amazing, mm. really amazing to think, holy crap, like, who gives a shit what is going on, Yeah, you know, in Italy in 1600? I do, <laughs> and I continue really to care about that, right. but I'm richer for having thought about what's also going on um, in Peru. Yes. In, you know, tens of thousands of years before that. Yeah. So. 
I think that's you brought up a good point too, is that um, a lot of the artists that I chose to focus on more in the global south because mm -hmm. there's so much information already about you know Europe and, and North America. Um, and so one of one of the things that I found really interesting was a lot of the artists in the global south are saying we're always looking to Europe, we're always looking to the U.S. and like why can't we be making stuff here? Like we should be changing our own, like looking making our own narrative instead of looking elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so there's kind of that shift that is really exciting to see. So, and also in, in my own art studies, I was told I couldn't, I had to go to Europe if I wanted to study art. Um, and I was like, why can't I go elsewhere? They're like, that's where the art is. I was like, oh. <laughs> so, you know, I wanted to see what's going on. But thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just wondered, you mentioned at the beginning that you're traveling around yeah. and you're an American woman going to different places. Yeah. What were the, what are the sticky bits of this project and how are you navigating them? Oh. So, there are a few. Yes, yeah, so you have to travel solo as well on this fellowship, um, which has been perfectly fine. I'm very independent. Um, but it has, I mean, it's definitely interesting. You have to be aware of your surroundings, all those kinds of things. I think it's also something I think a lot about and I'm trying to do a lot of work on is, you know, how I am engaging with different communities, especially, you know, communities of color as a white woman and, you know, the power that that has in doing this research. So that's also something that I'm um, uncomfortable with in a good way, right? Um, and other sticky bits, it can be really lonely uh, sometimes, right? So I, I really figured out towards the second half of this year that I've been really trying to um, root in communities a little bit more. I kind of spent the first few months going, well, there's this and there's this and there's this and there's this, and, and that was great, but you kind of lose a little bit of steam. Um, so I think I'm sadly at the end of it, um, but the last six months or so, I kind of was really focusing more on specific organizations and you know different artists as well and making my own art and that would help a little bit more with Jennifer as well. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank uh, so that's prepared. So I've gone a little bit. Thank you so much for your patience, anybody who's just presented. I know there were some difficult moments in organising the technology. I uh, really appreciate your, your being here. Um, uh, it's, it's already happened. So yeah, thank you. And, and I, I hope if, if say, lots of film, so it's probably we can share that in the end. So Okay, instead of the Okay, so it's a uh, are you how we can do it? That's the like what the other people do. Yeah, they yeah. just it means yeah. in various good. ways that people have. I'm going to um I'm going to mute now people online um because you don't need to hear all of this whilst we're on break. Hi, hi, landing. Hi, landing. We're going to mute for a bit just so it's just not crowd noise for a little while. Okay. Hi, hi. How are you? right so we have some people online still thank you for persevering online people i'm hoping that you can hear me now and can you hear me online people um so there are still some online people Hello, Landing. You can see me, I know. You can hear me then because you're waving. Fantastic. Right, that's good. We are not yet screen sharing. So uh, I'm going to screen share any minute now. Hello. Can you hear me well? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'll have to check that everybody can hear before we put on the screen share because as soon as it's on the screen share, we you can can't, no longer can't see the messages. You can so, no longer, um, so we're not on mute, but we're definitely recording and the video is on. So this is what people are seeing. No, no, no. When you want landing, Oh, hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you for staying on for this whole day and this whole afternoon. So we are incredibly pleased to be here, and it's been a fantastic two days. And yeah, so um, we're very honored also to give this uh, plenary here. And as you have seen from the title of our presentation, uh, we were mainly speaking about stop motion animation. If you don't know exactly what we're meaning by that, you will discover it throughout our talk. And we will gently come into issues of environmental advocacy. So not the entire talk is entitled about it. It's rather the story of stop motion animation and how the team, has come to learn about this technique and what, what our experiences with it have been about. So when I say the team, uh, so we are all involved with a master program at the University of Luxembourg that is dealing uh, with teaching and learning in multilingual and multicultural context. So and everyone on the team uh, is either a student or a graduate from that program. So we have uh, Goha, and we have Nia, and then we have Landing, who's online. Uh, so he would have loved to be here with us. So he joined uh, because he didn't get permission to enter the UK because of, um, yeah, because his visa was not approved. So, but we're very happy to, thanks to COVID, have digital technology in place that still allows us to be present even in a remote way. So um, yes, um, so what we're trying to do in this presentation is to share with you, it's a bit of an experimentation, so kind of open-ended, um, share with you our trajectories with stop motion animation and you will discover where this uh, leads us. So I'm happy to start. So I would like to say a few words about myself. So my background is in linguistics, so I'm a linguist. And my interest in objects started in 2003. And as you can see from the picture, there was a time when I was involved in a primary, bilingual primary school project, Italian German. And uh, children in this class were learning Italian and German at the same time, reading and writing. So, and here you're in the middle of what a regular literacy activity looked like. So children were asked to bring objects from home that were related to a particular letter or sound. So you would have things like sound and children had to decide to watch uh, what uh, language this object belonged. So that would be German, then you had dino, that would be Italian, or zucker or zucchero, that would be related to Italian, so it's a fun activity, children love it, it's very engaging. And it was going on until this strange object was presented. So, and um, it created quite a moment of puzzlement and particularly the teachers had no clue what this object represented. So uh, the children were much more uh, forward going, offering uh, explanations. And actually uh, it was a, a um, little handmade object made from a, a roll of toilet paper with a pointed hat. And the little boy who had brought it uh, 
Well, then uh, this was happy to agree that actually it was Razzo, Razzo which in uh, English is rocket. And um, there was a tiny little moment, but it was very significant because it disrupted the natural flow, natural uh, as, as set up by the teachers uh, uh, activity, and it opened up new kinds of discussion. So they started talking about literacy activities at home, outside of school, other types of relations. And uh, what that made me realize is the power of objects, one uh, uh, dimension of power of objects that has to do with the non-normativity of objects. So we can read into objects a lot of different types of meaning. So it has been mentioned in various contexts throughout the conference, openness to interpretation, uh, non-normativity, non-fixivity, -fix uh, and materiality actually matters. So what things are made of that help us to, uh, uh, discover meaning and what it did in this classroom, which was really um, interesting, was uh, that power relations got disrupted and destabilized because it was actually the teachers who had no clue what these things were, whereas children were, were perfectly fine. And um, so um, this was something interesting for me to learn about um, at that point. So who's the knowledgeable and who is the learner in the classroom? So the second moment I would like to share that have been really formative in my trajectory as a, as a researcher and as a human being was an opportunity I had to work with Inuit in uh, Canada, in Ottawa, so in a city community. And we were collaborating with the um, Ottawa Inuit, Inuit Children's Centre and my colleague Donna Patrick uh, and myself, we were proposing a project on literacy. So I have to say uh, that we pretty quickly understood um, about the dramatic detrimental impact that colonial uh, legacy had produced and how deeply involved literacy was in that. So I, I can, could talk at length about our learning, but what I, I'm going to say here just now is, uh, Literacy was never mentioned again throughout the entire project because otherwise we would probably not have had a project. And what we were doing instead was working with five uh, Inuit women who came from uh, all different parts of the Arctic on culturally meaningful activities uh, uh, for Inuit learning. So, and what the two things that were striking about that experience. Um, so all the activities that women suggested had objects at the heart. And there were two things that we understood. So objects were important for the community to uh, reconnect as a community, as a migratory community in the city, because as I said, they came from different uh, parts of the Arctic, speaking different languages and having different uh, types of cultural practices. And um, here, for instance, you see uh, Sue and her collection of ulus. These are uh, Inuit uh, women's knives, 12, uh, and they represented five generations of women. And there was a, a very vivid discussion, the objects being passed around, being smelled, being uh, uh, researched for the different types of qualities. And um, so as a, as a meaningful act for um, bringing them together as, as a community. So, and then there was a second um, the thing that was important for me to realize, we were thinking about activities that we could organize for the children. And also these activities usually had an object uh, involved. So one thing that we discussed uh, was the teaching of a little fishing song. And it was absolutely essential for the children to first build the fishing rod. So you cannot, just sing the song, but it needed to be a kind of performative act. And it was fairly interesting because the, the text of the song was going a bit like that. Oh, little fish, um, uh, don't be scared. I will fish you, but don't be sad. So it was really kind of imitating a conversation with, with the animal. And um, so it was like a we were talking about caring, caring relationships in, in, in teaching activities. And so um, what came up a lot in, in, in the work with these women, um, activities could not be decontextualized. They really needed to have a, a very contextual, a very sort of a, a immediate framing. And even though they were no longer living in the Arctic, so they were living in the city spaces, 
kind of context was uh, as good as it got in terms of uh, con context uh, uh, to be provided that, that was uh, seen as um, acceptable and meaningful for, for children to learn. So not building the rod, rod would not have been a meaningful, significant activity in terms of uh, Inuit learning. So and, um, later on, we understood they never um, kind of voiced that, but it was um, these relational objects underlying a particular cosmological view. So you cannot not use uh, the rod because it's the kind of uh, element that's sustaining the, the uh, structure that would incorporate things like the land. So that was a, a term that often came up, the land constituted of uh, humans, animals, spirits, the eyes, the water. So it would be uh, this um, uh, very, very maybe ecological system, we would maybe call it from that. And, and um, it was much later that I read about uh, post humanist and new materialism, uh, paradigms and, and research ideas, but and, and it, of course we mention them sometimes, uh, you know, in their resemblance or um, assumed resemblance to um, uh, indigenous uh, ways of of um, uh, philosophies or understanding the world, and 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 I felt at the time that was very deeply ingrained in what, what these women believe. So, and, and sometimes I have, I have the impression when that we are still sort of trying to get these ideas out, you know, in the Western world of, of academic circles and make them work. And uh, for them, it was really part of their daily, daily lives. Um, so the third point I want to mention uh, actually brings me back to the very place where we are at the moment. So I, I had the chance and was in, invited as an external, um, uh, advisor to a project that two colleagues um, here at Goldsmiths uh, conducted, uh, Vicky McElroy and um, Jim Anderson, and it had to do with multilingual digital storytelling. And that was also the context in which I met two wonderful women, Bo Chapman and Zoe Flynn. So they are uh, digital artists based here in London, uh, and they have a company called Salma Gandhi and now friends of mine. And, and we started a very uh, fruitful um, collaboration. And they actually uh, introduced me first to um, stop motion animation. And it kind of felt like the logical next step, uh, being interested in objects and how they relate to each other. So we brought a set, so we don't integrate this into presentation, but if you want to have a little go and, and try it out later on, so we, you, you can do that. Basically, it's uh, having an object taken out, in, uh, taking a shot, moving it a little bit, taking a shot, and so on, and doing that many, many times, and then playing uh, the series of photos back as film, you have a movement, an object that moves with all the magic that's involved, and you know that it unfolds to kids and to adults alike. So, and they've been coming to Luxembourg uh, since 2015, uh, talking about their work and uh, um, uh, inviting students to experiment with, with this technique. Um, uh, here, for instance, one uh, task that they gave to the students, uh, choose materials uh, and try to uh, represent an emotion or the change of an emotion from anger to joy or from, a depression to release or um and and it's 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 a very interesting exercise and, and students are asked not to try to represent the human face but really to work with the quality of of uh, the different types of materials provided like strings and nails and chains and, and stuff like that so um yeah so Concepts we've been working with to capture really what we learn when doing stop motion animation. And so we'll, you will hear more about it um, when, when I hand over to, to my co-speakers. So one um, idea that we've been playing with was uh, assemblage. So this is actually when you bring together heterogeneous little elements and create new types of meaning going beyond uh, what things um, conventionally can mean. Uh, experimentation is a huge um, 
uh, um, part of this way of working, trying to understand what materials can do that resonates also with many of the presentations with we've been hearing um, how they can fold, how they can bend, how we can kind of manipulate them and turn them into something different. So another um, idea that that really is seemed to kind of capture one of the effects that can be generated when doing stop motion animation was effective flow. So it's a very kind of immersive activity where people, some say it's like meditation therapy or so. So you, you forget a bit where you are and time and space and so on. You can really kind of focus on this manual repetitive uh, kind of activity. Relationality is also um, something uh, important. So we will say a bit more about that. Uh, enabling people to connect uh, in a very proximal way, in a very empathetic way, and sharing this uh, experience with us uh, seems to generate a new sense of care. I think this is true probably for many arts-based methods, um, but it's um, it was important for us to see that at work. And another idea that also has been voiced uh, already in other presentations is just uh, the act of disrupting. So we we um, and deterritorializing. So we, we had students who were very shy in the classroom uh, because they had a different language background and who would not feel entitled to speak because they were not good enough or didn't have the right kind of accent. And and this is a kind of activity where just everyone can move in and you start as soon as they have understood, you know, the, the principle how it works. Then it's a very kind of intuitive uh, process and. And, and even the, the <laughs> object that seemed to suggest the next move. So at the moments when talking just stops, you know, it's kind of uh, a very sort of self-suggestive um, thing. So we were a bit uh, reminded of the, the idea of the rhizome. Um, there are approaches um, where, Colleagues have been using uh, storyboards, but we found that uh, it almost works better without any previous idea. You just jump right in and see what comes out. And um, so it's the unplanned and the unpredictable nature of the process that makes it beauty and probably also its strength. And it's best to disrupt the kind of barriers that we have observed and tended to struggle with. Uh, so for me, that's the point to invite Mia. No, go on, sorry, to, to say a bit about her journey. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, I'm Gohar, and um, to speak a little bit about my personal discovery of stop motion animation, uh, dates back to 2018, where Bo and Zoe, mentioned by Gabi, they came to Luxembourg, and they offered this summer school of learning stop motion animation as a digital storytelling tool. And in the summer school, we were asked to bring in objects which we would like to animate. And I came there with my object, which was a carrot. And not just because I like carrots, but there was another reason that I went there with a carrot. It was because um, just shortly before this summer school, we had Gabi's class, Lernen ohne Grenzen, which means learning without borders. And Gabi asked us to bring uh, objects that contained letter Z in our mother tongue. And uh, in Armenian, uh, carrot is called gazar. So I went there, I brought my carrot with me, and I said, so here is the Armenian, uh, uh, called Ar in Armenian gazar. It's a language that is in Indo-European language family, but has nothing to do with other languages. It has a separate alphabet, and it's a separate branch on the, on the language family. But there I go, and then I say gazar, and I have class, uh, classmates who go like, oh, in uh, Indian language, in one of the Indian languages, we, we call it jazar. And then another one in the uh, uh, Persian language, uh, jazar. And some this kind of contributions when I'm like, oh my God, this is actually it's not as, a, as secluded language as I thought it was. So co completely shocked, I go to the summer school with my carrot, but then I feel like uh, everybody else came with uh, even more emotionally, uh, emo uh, even if objects that have even more emotional connotations, such as someone brought a bookmark given by their grandfather who passed away. Someone came with a music player through which they discovered their uh, the, the world of music, etc. And I was there with my character and I was like, oh my God, how am I going to animate this object? What am I going to do with it? 
So for a long time, I was there, like, it, it's really not staged. I was sitting like that in that picture captured by Gabi. And I was like, why did I bring them there? What can I do with it? And uh, being blocked and stuck for a while, later on, I realized that actually uh, what stop motion animation, uh, why it's, it's great, this tool, is that you can basically do anything. It's a very fluid and flexible space. So there, I started repur repurposing this object, the carrot, uh, kind of going beyond it's just a, a, its notion of just a vegetable, but also like kind of even like anthropomorphizing it, like relating to it, and thinking what it could do. It could dance, it could do stuff, it could move, it could come into different shapes. And there I got in, into this inspirational, more creative space, and I delved into it and I started doing a lot of interesting and fun things to actually tell my story which then they, therefore brought me in, into this meditative space because that's what Gabi was mentioning. When you do these repetitive actions, move, take a picture, move, take a picture, somehow you get detached, really detached from the outside world. And you're in this flow, you're in this um, mindset that it's clear, it's empty, and you're just continuing the same thing. So it's really very therapeutic after what I realized. Mm -hmm. So that was my first contact with the stop motion animation. And later on, we launched a project uh, uh, with Nia and Gabi, uh, which is called Together Against Discrimination, where we actually use stop motion animation as a tool to tackle and talk about sensitive issues re uh, related to discrimination, racism, uh, exclusion. So uh, we would get together with our participants and us as well, we would tell such personal sensitive issues because everybody at least once in their lives normally comes co with contact to such an experience. And we, we would just then afterwards, after sharing this um, uh, experiences, we would try to tell them through stop motion animation. And what we realized was that actually like somehow you detach from the negativity of the experience because it's such a lighthearted, fun, and uh, sort of, yeah, um, Kind of uh, liberating process where you you kind of process even even process your experience of this negative uh, event, and that's uh, that's where we discovered this property, this quality of uh, stop motion animation, um, as uh, yeah as a tool of addressing sensitive topics. And now I invite you to take the to take a look at the the carrot movie I made. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you like it. Uh. How do I start it? Oh, here. Yeah. Okay, now I'm. <laughs> so now we move on to Nia Ruchi. Well, I'm going to put my timer just to make things go Yes. So, yeah, now I'm going to share with you my experience using this tool. 
and the impact that it has had uh, in my life and how I found out that it is super powerful when you're trying to tackle sensitive social issues that require attention, but also action. Since it has the yeah, power to touch you not only rationally, but mainly emotionally. And that is super important, I think. We believe when trying to make a change to touch people in their hearts and also in, in their minds. So um, my first experience with stop motion animation was during a course with Gabby as well, learning on it Hansen. And there we had the assignment that was um, telling the educational journey of one of our classmates in a creative way. So Gabby told us, please think out of the box, do something creative. You can use language or not. And I was like, well, what can I use? And I had seen um, some videos about stop motion. I had never explored it out. And I was like, well, why not? And then I started um, interviewing my classmates. She told me her story. Then the next day I started animating it. And it was such a deep experience um, embodying her trajectory, her emotions, her struggles in, in this little movie. Um, and it allowed me to have a very deep, empathic uh, experience. Like I could see myself in her journey and also reflect on my own. So that was kind of the first or yeah, highlights from stop motion that it, it's a, a tool for empathy. You can really connect to people's story emotionally first. And, so yeah, this is the movie, which I won't show you, because we don't have the time, unfortunately. But um, a second experience um, of using a stop motion as a tool to raise awareness on sensitive issues was a collaborative project that we did in another course with Gabby. And here with some other colleagues who wanted to tackle the topic of psychological violence, because we thought that it was relevant to talk about it since we knew people who had suffered physical or psychological violence, and we thought it was relevant to touch on this topic. Um, and working together helped us to first reflect on this topic, share our ideas, and think collectively, and put our, our collective ideas in one like entity, one product. And that was super powerful because um, we had to negotiate. We had to, we were invited to be humble also, to accept other people's ideas and, and be flexible about it. So again, stop motion as a tool to think collectively and do collectively. So, um, yeah. And then last um, experience I'll talk to you about was a, an internship project that I did during COVID home internship, where we were invited to yeah, work, create our own internship, our own knowledge. And I spent kind of four months creating this uh, movie where I tackled the topic of transformation and metamorphosis, because yeah, I think it's relevant and we can see it both in the mind. The mind has this capacity to transform to metamorphose, metamorphosize itself. Mm -hmm. um, same as nature, I observed this tree um, for four months. I took pictures almost every day. And then I, um, a friend performed the butterfly, um, metamorphosis. It was so, so powerful because as I was creating the movies, I had this inner reflection process where I, um, question my own transformation processes and the ones that I want to reach and this relationship with, with nature and how everything is in constant change. And um, it was very powerful to do like an inner discovery. So stop motion, again, super, super powerful tool, especially when it comes to human, our human sense, our emotions, our, um, yeah, what's not tangible. So, um, yeah, and one of the movies that, yeah, the butterfly, the metamorphosis is when I kind of show it also because it's very long. So I'm gonna share with you a short movie that we did in the framework of the project together against discrimination. And here is very simple one. Um,
So um, yeah, to include my little parts, that motion can be a space for creativity, but also a space for human connection and, and for change from the heart rather than initiative from your mind. So it's very powerful. And now I'll hand over to Landing, who will bridge our stop motion and environmental. And I think we need some help from you. Okay. So will you want to show anything still, or are you just going to, yes. yeah, landings, you're going to show some more slides? Yes. Okay. So, um, landing, can you um, talk out? Let's see if we can hear you. Hello. No, we can't hear you. It's okay. Uh, landing, can you talk? Hello, I'm talking. We can't hear you. Uh, are you. You're not muted. You're not muted on here. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, volume. Uh, there is an option to share the audio. Hello. Yeah. No, but I'm just doing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> it must be not there. Yeah. Yeah. Computer okay. sound. <laughs> it works. Please restart your audio sharing application. We can't restart it. Um, I'm just going to put in my password, see if it will take it. Oh, we can. Ending? Hello. Oh, oh. hey, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Just a little comment about uh, Landing's first presentations. He'll do it in French, and the second part will be in English. So you'll have some support <laughs> there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Landing? Oui. You, you can start. OK. Um, Donc, okay. Euh, je... Oh, OK. Ça va, c'est bon. On t'entend. C'est bon? OK. Oui, D'accord, je vais parler un peu plus fort. Oui, um, c'est bon jusque-là ou bien? Hello? Hello, oui. Je vous entends bien. Oh, he's speaking. Yeah, but then there is no... It's in the um, Maybe you can get a bit closer to the mic, to your mic. Vous m'entendez, allô? What is it? You disappeared again, the whole thing. I don't know. Allô? Online, they can hear you. You, you on and off. Yeah, we, we can hear sometimes, can't we? Who knows? We can call him. We can call him. I'm thinking about it as well. Yeah. You want to call him on? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Put it on speakerphone. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have his number? I have his number, yes. Um, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Mimi. Hello. We're going to call you on your phone. Okay. Weird. Oh, hello. Uh, maybe he'll join again. He thinks you're going to call me to be on the call, maybe. Uh, this is the participants okay. 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 Is there a way to oh, speak hello hello yeah. yeah, so we couldn't hear you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Try making him a co-host, see if that makes any difference. Okay, maybe we're 
when I find a way because like this we right here I must as well. If we don't connect with those yeah. Yeah. to this one, yeah, that's probably complicated, no? Okay. So you can call me on WhatsApp. This is my number. Uh, no, no, don't worry. Okay. I mean, you're trying. London is a co-host now. Okay. okay. You are a co-host now. Maybe, um, maybe you can try to reconnect with this using the same link. And he's gone off mute. So, um, mute. Yeah. yeah. Okay, because sure. we, we cannot see you. <laughs> oh, no, okay, sorry. let me first try that. And if not, That's then I'll uh, call you back. Thank you for uh, perseverance, everybody. This is real international attempts at connection. He's back uh, here. Connecting to audio. Okay, so I think we skipped that part because um, he really should have told about this experience. So we moved straight to the collective project we started doing, and we would like to share this with you. Hopefully, we have some sound. Okay, so what we would have suggested next, we will not do that, to do the little Mentimeter exercise is how you create a word cloud. So what do you think this film is about? I think we save the time now. Any ideas you just want to throw into the room? What the film is about? Mm -hmm. Rising sea, more like mm -hmm. water coming in. Okay, so yeah, you want to speak to the to the best picture? Um, you want to do it? You want to do it? Maybe we can do it together. Okay. It's part okay. So um, Len now Lenning was going to talk about his village, so that would really be his part. So he selected the images of the next part of the presentation, and uh, so this is his village. A uh, small island in the south of Senegal, region of Sigrinko, department of Usowe. I'm probably saying that wrong. With less than 800 inhabitants, and the main activities are agriculture, fishing, and art. Um, yeah. okay. Well, here, uh, Slending share with us, you can see the rice fields, which is big part of their income of their village um beautiful fields 
which provides uh, work for both women and men. Um, for this, yeah. Collect salt, women. Okay. Mm -hmm. oysters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The main mean of transportation are these boats. So there are no roads. The man on the back is the pilot, the driver, as he said. Yes. And this is oh. children. They're going to uh, do some activity that helps them to earn some income. Everything mm -hmm. will plantation. Mm -hmm. So some of the women of the village. And then there was an incident. So there were children visiting who did not know how to swim. And um, in a, a boat collapsed and eight people were killed. So the um, Senegalese uh, diaspora uh, sort of um, got together, mobilized to raise funds to buy. Um, um, life jackets. And this is these the uh, images you see here are from the ceremony when the life uh, jackets were um, yeah, handed to the community. Um, and many of them are um, from London's family, so you would be able to to name them for you. Yeah, and he took most of the pictures and often he says, oh, in this picture, here's, this is my cousin, that's an aunt, uh, um, uh, uncle of mine. And it's very, it's really interesting when he is presenting it because then you get the feeling it's his village, the people he knows. And yeah, as you see, most of the pictures, the popular designing's uh, name because he was the one photographing and then putting it out there. And here's how the village was celebrating when they got the life jackets. And there's a picture, especially I love very much upcoming one, I think. Yeah, they, they the women of the village, they have this uh, clapping mm -hmm. <laughs> instruments in their hands to actually celebrate and so, yeah, congratulate this um, gift that they got the life jackets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he also mentioned tourism is an important source of income for his village. So they um, have done different initiatives um, to support this job, this, yeah, this activity. So this is a boat. I think one of his family members Purchase the other purchase. Yeah. Um, to commute tourists from one side to the other of the village. Yeah. And, and I think this is taken in a small sort of hotel. And the owner who is uh, owning that space, who built that space, he also generated the income to buy the boat that you saw in the previous mm -hmm. uh, picture. And here you see. A gentleman, I think he was from Belgium, and they signed a partnership agreement with the village chief to buy some solar uh, panel. But he said he wasn't quite sure whether that had materialized that project. So, but it was um, important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they also collect rainwater in these uh, super big tanks. Um, so here you can see the renov renovation uh, work going on there. Yeah, and the, the lid was destroyed at the previous tank, and now they, they had help from an NGO and built them to rebuild it. So we have pictures of the rice actually growing. Well. We've just got about six minutes yeah, till the end of the conference can... now. So, okay, so we go. Oh, we're going to yeah, have pictures things. of the village, people plowing the, the, the soil. Mm -hmm. And the women harvesting the rice. And now, the reason that brought us here, which is 
the sea levels and salt levels yeah. are destroying all the the fields right. and that's affecting the whole community in in many ways um yeah as rice being one of the main uh, income sources for the village basically uh, the rising levels of the sea washing away the rice fields creating this disaster but not only because the income source is kind of um, a danger but also people's lives because it also creates uh, difficulties for movement it creates difficulties for actually preserving the houses because the rice and so uh, the water levels are approaching the soil and the houses and destroying demolishing the, the, uh, the infrastructure so yeah and you see what is growing instead are mangroves because they can support like salty and uh, water yeah. but the rice it cannot grow in, in yeah. rough water and salty water uh -huh. and he said that all these areas have been rice fields in the past so that's what uh, the land looks like and also houses are sort of in danger of being flooded. So, um, yeah, so this is um, uh, the, what the uh, diaspora did to organize, to do something for the, for, for the village back home. So they uh, first created an association that later became an NGO, and that's called Stand for El Ubalia. And it's uh, it has its headquarters in in the US, and so they bought the life jackets and bought a, a PC and a printer for the primary school at home, and raised funds to do a study. And they have a project to build a dike because uh, to to prevent the sort of uh, ongoing uh, loss of land. And so they're still looking for support and uh, try also to to build a road that will connect to uh, to um, uh, the national road because now there's no road and you're sort of there by the road. Yeah, so um, we we put the uh, the link to the Facebook site stand for Elubalia, so you can check it out. We'd be happy to share the slides with you. And we would just say um, um, so we we recognize, and that's the part that we didn't we didn't say, and that's important. So I learned about the problem because he did a movie, an individual movie in one of my classes. He had never spoken about it. And he, he had the story to share about how this was a space for him to not being at home, thinking about the issue. So, and and then he wrote a, a reflective piece. So that's what I always ask students to do, to think about the activity. And that's how I learned about it. And then we talked about it. So it became not the individual project became one that became a topic of discussion for the entire class and then also for, for us to to work on it so and um yeah so what we want to do next is to work a little bit more on the film so actually it was created in an hour or so so you can see you can maybe you saw some hands in yeah, yeah yeah we didn't do much of everything and uh so the idea is to uh, offer it to the facebook side and to help and try to support uh, this initiative and just to also make the, the situation known for more people. So please feel invited to share the link or yeah, however you know if your networks to make the issue known to, to a wider audience. Yeah, so and this is the last slide. Oh, you. We're I think we're out of time now. Okay. We've got two minutes to wrap up. Okay. So. Yeah. Uh, is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. Just yeah. um, bearing in mind, people might be catching trains. <laughs> yeah, I'm very sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, heard as well. So, but but you managed to share some of the the story, if not his slides. So that's fantastic. And landing. Um, if you're online and you can hear us, uh, in fact, everybody online, if you'd like to just come on camera now so that we can see you as well, everybody online. Um, hooray, so it's lovely to see you. Um, I'm even going to try something brave in moving the camera around, seeing as it doesn't really matter if it falls over. So there you go, that's our, that's our room of, of happy people, lovely, lovely happy people, pleased to see you. So um, 
I'm just going to kind of wrap up our conference now and that um, it's been absolutely wonderful to be able to share this time with you both in person and online and to get a sense of all of these uh, <laughs> So um so yeah to get a sense of of where we're all coming from and sometimes literally from the places that the making spaces of the places geographically that we are and the kind of localities that we get to know and, and how we experience them. Um I'm sorry I can't do face to be blonde. Mm -hmm. Totally disoriented, okay. but yeah, um, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, this is great. If back, if my back is to you, then I have some kind of side profile, as well. yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so at least you can see there are people in the room online and, and, and all of that. So, it's been absolutely wonderful to hear those stories, narratives, and there have been so many synergies. Uh, keep visiting keynote speakers and said, oh, it's been just wonderful to hear these connections reverberating around the room, but also the different stances and positions that we're all taking in relating to that, and the particular specific depths of knowledges that we're finding, because let's face it, you know, it takes time to do these things. It takes time to go to these particular communities, to research these particular authors, to um, recount our own experiences to meet these diverse groups of people who are all different groups of people um you know the, the, the school students that we worked with uh here in london and their experiences of ecologies in practice have uh, a very different potentially to the the school students or the young people uh over in the desert so there's a whole range of different communities of experience that we've heard about in this conference. And I feel very privileged to have met you all, um, both in person and online. And we hope to continue these conversations and for these to be starting points. So as I said yesterday, uh, I will share everybody's emails. Unless you say, no, please don't share my email. I don't want to have any more emails mm -hmm. from the conference. Uh, and then you can send resources, you can send links and so on. Uh, I, I won't go as far as creating a WhatsApp group. That seems a bit, oh no, you'd be muting the notifications all the time, wouldn't you? But um, there, there's a lot of fantastic synergies that are emerging. We're hoping that from this conference, there will be several uh, developments in terms of future projects and bids and exploration that are brought together between academics and practice researchers and museum workers and independent researchers, artists, so that everybody's voices are valued as equal in that process. And um, thank you all so much. <laughs>